six feet by eight and a half feet painting. Essentially is what I'm working on. Of course, um, for some of the people who haven't seen all my paints over here, I have one I've done with uh, with a, a Kemet or Egyptian, ancient Egyptian. That is uh, the, the king, or they call him the Sibiti. Classically, back in those days, it was called Kemet. It was not called Egypt. Egypt comes from the uh, a, a word that basically when the Ptolemaic, the Greek Ptolemaic kings took over, Hijapata, and the Hijapata got shortened into he Egypt. But, uh, and then also that's his queen, ha Haru. So he was Haru, the word hero comes from that. So he was the protector of his people, which also has to do with savior, also has to do with Messiah, because you see how these concepts come to us from today, from ancient Africa. Ancient Egypt was Africa. They were African people. They dressed like African people. They look, walk, and talk like African people. And then, of course, over here, I have Ra on the throne. That's basically the sun. And you can see there's an hourglass, and there's uh, some wine there. And he's over the earth, so time is winding up. He's thinking about, uh, you know, the last and final judgment. But instead of having it as the Abrahamic religion, I have it as the Kemet perspective. But right now, I've switched my attention on Native Americans from the East Coast, most notably the Mattapanai, Pamunkey Native Americans, as well as the, uh, the Chickahominy. Those are the, the main three tribes from the Richmond area that's left. I don't know if you can hear me because uh, I have my, uh, I have my, my uh, wireless mic here so I can get better sound, but I'm kind of out of uh, nine volt batteries. So let me see if I can just get a fresh battery and put it in here. If I feel something from something else, just to make sure my batteries are working. I don't know if anybody can hear me or not, but I just want to make sure my battery is working so I have good sound coming through. So I'm going to pull out this old battery and put in a new one. Okay, so I got a slightly better battery in there. I don't know if you guys can hear me or not now, but I got a slightly better battery in there. Hopefully my batteries will be coming in. But these are the paints I'm gonna be working on today. And my account that I usually paint from is uh, basically, uh, they shut me down for 30 days and put me in Facebook jail because they was offended because I was actually, I'm also a historian as well as a fine artist. And you can see I have Barack Obama in the background. I have Nipsey and Tupac there. I have a variety of paintings. I have like uh, about 15, 16 paintings in the studio actually. But this is the current one that I'm working on today. So as I paint, I'm going to be telling the story of the Virginia natives, the natives that's basically from this area. The, uh, I'm going to be telling the story of um, the people that they call the Powhatan Indians. Of course, Indian is a bad word. The real word we want to use, indigenous natives. They were the people who was native and indigenous to this area before for tens of, or maybe perhaps hundreds of thousands of years. Before any other groups of people came over, these are the indigenous people of the East Coast, which is an Araquarian lingu linguistic group. So they range all the way from the Great Lakes of Canada, uh, all the way down to Massachusetts, all the way down through Virginia, actually all the way to Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, going across the Appalachians into Western Virginia, <clears throat> and even in Kentucky. And a lot of them uh, on the Trail of Tears had to move to some place called that we call today Oklahoma. So the Cherokee natives, they're also a part of this confederation. It was 31 actual tribes. Now actually inside of those 31 tribes, there was even more sub-tribes. And that's what a lot of people don't understand about Native Americans. They didn't have last names. They had tribal names. And then they had a first name. And then they had a title. So that's how they, it wasn't like the English system. So this is why you have sub-tribes, people called different things, but essentially the Manipunai is the same group as what they call the Powhite. Now, a lot of people think that Powhatan, that's the name of the natives. Actually, the king who was Wohan Sanoka, his, he was from a place called Powhite Aten. Powhite Aten. Basically, Powwow means place. Pow means place. Powwow means place of gathering. And so Powwow means actually Powwow means uh, place of gathering. Pow height means divine place. Height means divine place. Aten means the sun. So divine place of the sun. 
And basically the name that they use, the Native American use for God was Mache Manuto. Mache Manuto. That's how it's pronounced. Mache Manuto. That was the word. Basically it meant nature. Everything you see around you is the great spirit. That's what it means. Great spirit. Well, everything, everything that you see in the natural world is alive, including the rocks, including the animals. It's a part of you. You cannot separate yourself from nature. So therefore, the Native Americans, if they had to hunt, before they would take their born arrow and kill a deer, they said, look, I have to kill you so that I can feed my family. Thank you. And they would actually pray a small prayer <laughs> to the animal before they actually shot and killed it. And they only killed what they needed to eat. And so they didn't just kill for sport. It was not an enjoyment or a pleasure thing. It was a thing that they did because they needed to eat. The same thing with the fish. And also they were primarily farmers. The Native Americans from the Virginia area was called the Powhite Tons. Actually, they called them Powhite. The, the colonials called them Powhites simply because of the fact that the chief or the king, well, really the word wasn't king. The word was was a warrant. So you, if you was the head or the commander of a certain tribe, if you were the king of a certain tribe or governor of a certain tribe, you'd be called a Wessa Warrants. So the chief Wessa Warrants was named Wahan Sinoka. Okay? So I just want to get that clear straight off. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to paint. And as I start to paint, what I'm going to also do is I'm going to teach history as I paint. Now, these things are not necessarily easy to do. As I tell people, it's not easy to do high-end fine arts painting that I do on a large scale in oil and at the same time teach very, very complex history uh, on a very, very deep level. So bear with me as I do this. Now, I don't know if... I don't know if this account is going to get shut up, shut down. I don't know why my accounts got shut down, because, but somebody either reported me or Facebook just is not friendly towards telling the truth about what happened to the Native Americans. I don't know what it is, but this is the painting that I'm working on. This is a fort at Jamestown. This painting is with Wahan Sanoka. Once they abducted Matoa, this painting is called The Abduction of Matoaka. Basically, what happened was the colonials had died was dying of starvation they also was being hunted by the natives because as soon as they got off the ship what people would think is that when the james Cam colonists got off the ship they was friendly but actually as soon as they got off the ship they uh <laughs> fired on the natives and so it was a war from the very beginning uh it was not good from the very beginning and they said the reason i mean this is in the journals from the actual ships of jamestown so the british reported this themselves and they said they did it because they had encountered some Spanish on the way, uh, I guess from Bermuda, where they were coming from, to Jamestown. Because they went to they went from England to Bermuda, and then they kind of restocked there. And then they came to up the coast and stopped at Jamestown. So what happened was they ran into some Spanish, and they had to fight them. These were missionaries. These were soldiers. These were men of war. They were not settlers. They were not colonizers. They were not people trying to find something. This is a company called the London Company that hired people just for the express purpose because they already had uh, devastated the Aztec. They already devastated the Mayans. They already devastated the Incas. Incas. They found tons of gold. So they thought there was more gold in North America. So it was coming here with the, with the thing to do the same thing Cortez did, was to go in, take everything for themselves, kill off the natives and own the land. However, the pretenses is, especially what we celebrate today with Thanksgiving and all this stuff, like the natives that was, uh, you know, they were friendly to the natives and they were friendly natives. There was unarmed friendly natives. As soon as they got off the ship, they started an open air musket fire on the natives. The problem is in the long haul, they found it very difficult. They had, um, Mosquitoes that was biting them, all kinds of stuff. They found it difficult to be resupplied on their food. So they became dependent on the natives. And then all of a sudden, the thing changed from them being very aggressive to them basically appreciating when certain friendly neighbors, natives, so the neighbors were, natives were not hostile, aggressive all the time. The natives, their nature was to be very friendly. The problem is some were friendly at first, 
And then all of a sudden they say, oh, okay, we get shot upon. We get killed. Some of our love, beloved people are getting killed. Therefore, we must fight back. So in this case, OPEC Chicano never trusted these people at first. What people don't realize, it was a group of people called the Moors. Uh, Alonzo, uh, uh, Pedro Alonzo Nino was already trading in North America, not just in the Caribbean and in South America and Central America. He was already trading in Florida, places like that, with the natives. That's why we had the Seminoles there. There's a mix of people from Spain, Africans, and natives. So these people were coming from Africa. He was the one that led the ships of Columbus in 1492. Columbus didn't just come on his own. He was following Pedro Alonso Nino. So what you have is you have African Moors coming from West Africa, very tough, very uh, knowledgeable sailors. They also was in Spain. The Moors were in Spain. They were kicked out of Spain uh, during like a, a Christian revolution. They were kicked out of Spain, especially when Islam started coming into to, to Europe. So they were kicked out of Spain. And what happened was you had a person named Don, D-O-N, that's a title, like an Earl or Duke, Louis, Luis, L-I-U-S. He was an African person who came to Virginia long before the Jamestown colonies and who befriended the father of so-called Chief Powhatan, who his real name was Owan Sanoka, Wesley Warren's Owan Sanoka. And in befriending him, what they would do is they would intermarry. Generally, they were, if there was a prominent, very important person, they would marry a more prominent woman. Most likely, they married, he married, uh, they have a matriarch system with the, the Native Americans. So most likely what happened was Don Lewis married a person who was capable of producing the next king. The king, actually the next queen, and the queen, the parents would select the strongest, toughest, native to be the next king. So that's why Matoka was important because the bloodline, the royal bloodline ran through the woman, not the man like in the English system. It's the exact opposite. Uh, her mother produced uh, uh, Wuhan Sanoka. And her grandmother produced the king before that and so on. And so that's how that system worked. That system did not go through Wuhan Sanoka's son. It went through Wuhan Sanoka's daughter. And the daughter that was selected to be the, 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 the divine womb of the nobility was Matoka. Her name was not Pocahontas. Poca means what in Spanish? Little. Hontas means what in Greek? Whore or B-I-T-C-H. So therefore, Pocahontas is a slur against the Native Americans itself. It's a slur against her because the Matapanai natives, if you go down to Chief Costello, who is deceased now, but they're... Their archives that they had, because they learned to speak and write English early on in the 1600s, their records say that Matoaka, or the person we call Pocahontas, was raped by not just John Roth and Captain John Smith, but several other uh, colonials as well. And then once she became pregnant with Thomas Roth, it was important for him as a Christian to actually properly marry her. She only lived three years after marrying him before she was dead conveniently but the baby survived <laughs> you know and the baby never really aligned itself to the natives the baby actually wound up growing up to align itself against the english invaders the colonials and actually became a general fighting against the natives so even though they say in the history books that john ross was friendly with opec Ch chanacano because in 18, uh, in 16, for example, the, 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 the British came in 1607. And when Captain John Smith said when he first met Matoaka, the person you call Pocahontas, she said she appeared to be about 10 years old. That was his, what he said. And this was in 1608 when he met her. And she was younger than 16. He said she appeared to be a little child of six, about 10 years old or younger. Okay, and then so what that would mean that if she was 10 years old, then she was born in 1598, which means if she died in, in 1618, that means that she was only 18 years old when she died. Therefore, if she had her son in 1614, that would mean that 
If you get to 1614, so you add six to 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 uh, the age that John uh, Roth, I mean, when John Smith saw her, she was 10. So if you go from 1608 to 1614, that would be six years. That means she was 16 years old when she actually, or 15 years old, I should say, when she was actually had a child and was raped by John Roth and had a baby. But uh, what the Native Americans say, especially the Mattapanai, and the, not just the Mattapanai, but the head people of the Mattapanai, say that even before that age of 15, she was already being raped from the point she was abducted. And she was abducted in 1613. So in 1613, she was tricked onto the ship of Captain Argyle and taken to the Jamestown Fort to be held as hostage so that the fort would not get attacked anymore by Opak Tonkano. Because they was getting ravaged. They was getting, they was getting messed up. They, the, the natives were going to take over. So they had to do something. So what they did was they found out that Matoaka was the favorite child of the paramount king, the king of all the other tribes. You had a Wessowarns, and then he was the king of kings, literally. He was the emperor, so to speak. Even John Smith in his journal called him the emperor, not a chief. They called him the emperor of multiple tribes, and it was 31 tribes he was in charge of. And he was basically the king of, the emperor of. And the, his, the reason Matoka was his favorite child because she was the one that the next, that the bloodline was going to flow through. She was selected by their religious people and by the mother and father, by Wahan Sanoka and his wife themselves, to be the mother of the future kings. Therefore, they should have never ever let uh, Matoka get close to the colonies, but what happened was there was a tribe that was friendly with the uh, with the English, and they were a little bit. They were one of the small tribe. They were one of the tribes that was not underneath Wahan Sanoka's. They were kind of like uh, adversaries to the to Seneca to the Powhatans, and to Wahan Sanoka. And what happened was they basically offered them pots and pans and tools, axes, and spears, and stuff like that. If they gave them that, that kind of stuff, what they did was this uh, person um, who was a Native American rival, I forget exactly what tribe, but it was one of the neighbor, the, the tribe is extinct now. However, the king of that tribe and her half-sister, who was jealous because she did not get selected to be the bloodline of the next kings. And her husband was not selected to be the main king. However, her actual husband was name was Kakum. And Kakum was from the Mattapanai area of King William, Virginia. And what happened was once they abducted her in 1613, she already had a child, which was a girl by Kakum, which means that she was a girl that was the next bloodline. And what the natives did was they hid the girl. However, they wound up since they thought that the kings come through the mail, they kill Kokum. Therefore, Kokum died, and then within days of that, these people were raping her to decimate her, to make her so that no other native would want her, thinking that that's how they worked. That's not actually how they worked, because a person of the royal bloodline, a woman, the men could have multiple wives, but the women of the royal bloodline could actually have multiple husbands. A lot of people, they had the main husband who was the king, which they had the main children of the bloodline with, but they both could actually have multiple different spouses after that, according to, that's how they actually added tribes. That's how they actually made peace. They were literally intermarried. They were shared. <laughs> and so what happened was John Roth and, Powell and, and uh, John Smith learned about this, and they desired to become kings themselves, being lowly merchants. Their merchant status. They were not the aristocracy status. They was courting the aristocracy. They knew the aristocracy. They were walking in the royal courts. But they weren't aristocracy. So by John Roth thinking that he could marry an actual queen and the daughter of the king, knowing that they had a matriotic system, he felt that he became actually the king. 
of the so-called New World. It didn't have a name at this point from the English standpoint, but they did have a name from the Native American standpoint, the indigenous Native American standpoint, and that was the Tacina Kamoka. That was their actual name. It was no Powhatan, Powhite Acton. That's basically what it was. Pow meaning place, height meaning holy, Acton means place of the sun. Okay, so basically holy place of the sun, Powhite Acton. And that's it was actually, that was, hello, Angel, and my cousins are here. I'm talking about the Mount of Panah, Angel. I'm talking about Grandpa's family, okay? So um, <clears throat> anyway, that's basically what the names were. Wuhan Sanoka, Opek Chanakano, and Matoka. Now, the thing about they teach us her name is Pocahontas. Again, I say Poca means what in, Sp in Latin or Spanish or the Latin languages? It means little, poquito. Poco means little. Hantis means what in Greek? It means whore or B-I-T-C-H. Okay, so what Native American that never had any contact with Europe knew Greek or Latin? Only an educated Englishman knew that. So they were basically having a fancy way of putting in their journals, calling her little whore, without the common, uh, without the commoner English knowing what it meant. But it still sounded like it could have been a name that the natives had because it was a lot of po and a lot of mocha and a lot of stuff like that in their language. So this was all stuff they were learning. So this is how she got that fake name of Pocahontas. That was never her name. The reason they know her name is Matoka because it's a county in Virginia called Matoka. So the powers that educated people know what her real name is. They know her name is Matoka. Not only that, in the military, in the Navy, the USS Matoka. So even the U.S. Navy has named a vessel after Matoaka. They didn't name it Pocahontas. They didn't name it the Disname because these are honorable people. The military guys got to go out there and risk their life. They're not going out there with some, 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 some BS stuff. They're going to go over there and name her the real name of honor. And that name is Matoaka. That basically means Matoaka meant the woman of the divine womb. <laughs> basically, that's what it meant. Her other name was Anuet. I'm in Uet. I'm in Nuet. So she had multiple names. According to, if she was in ceremony, her name was Matoaka. If she was in royal ceremony, her name was Matoaka. If she was just around and just around her friends and just as she was, her name was Anna. Uh, I'm in. I mean, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm in Nuet. Nuet. So that was her name. That was her actual name. Now, her other names that the English gave her was Rebecca Roth because John Roth was trying to cover his rape of her because the child was the evidence that she was, they had sex. He wanted to take possession of the child. He didn't want to put the child away. So it was necessary for him in Jamestown to orchestrate a Christian ceremony by which she became a Christian. But she wasn't a Christian because when they took her to England, she took uh, a native priest with her who was a good friend of Wuhan Sanoka. Therefore, she was still a nature worshiper and a sun worshiper because that's where the Thunderbird comes from, which is the American Eagle, which is the Golden Falcon. All these words, Megichi, means Golden Falcon. Okay, there's a bunch of words that basically, and if you put an eagle's feather in your head, that means you were a great person. And the way they got that, there was several ways you could get a feather. You got a feather for doing something great in battle, and a chief had to award it to you, or it literally fell from the heavens, and the actual nature gave it to you, or Mache Minuto gave it to you. So there was multiple feathers of different birds. They all had different significances. And basically, whichever feather came across your path was the spirit world, they believe, communicating to you. So these will go into their feathers, into their hats, and into their pelks, and into their garment. And they will wear this on their weapons, and they will wear this on their garments, and they will wear them according to, for example, if it was one about them being a kind person, is when there was one the family, they would basically have those feathers in their pelt, a certain pelt with those feathers. If it was uh, so they had different uniforms like we had, but it was based on nature. That's why you see feathers. So if they was in war, it would probably have been an eagle's feather 
or a hawk or a falcon's feather or a raven's feather, something that basically is a symbol of a mighty man in war. So you could just have this big bonnet like you see today, people just buy a bonnet. Well, you can't get that. Nobody's killing anybody to get that many feathers anymore. And usually if a chief done that, he saved. It's not so much that he did all of the fighting, but he might have saved that many of his people. He might have been involved in that many battles where he got one feather each time he saved all of his people from peril. So that's how you earn them. So these guys with these uh, big things that they have on and they're just wearing them, that's all, they've lost the meaning, the original meaning that they used to have. But anyway, what I'm doing is telling the true story of the so-called Powhite, Pow Powhatan natives, which is Powhatan is the wrong way to say the name. It's called Powhite Aten. Powhite Aten. That's how you say it. And that was Richmond, Virginia, Churchill to be exact. His village was Churchill, specifically where Wilhans and Noka live, was right at the on the 95, right today's geographic location, where the 64 and the 95 meet at that junction. That's where he lived. Now, if you go up the hill of Church Hill and look over to the James River, that's where his main chief council group was. So <laughs> that's where he lived. That's where his specific tribe lived. And they used to call that Powhite Aten, and I don't know the Native American name for hill, but it's Powhite Aten ill, he ill. Now, Powhite is the bond air area of Richmond, just to make that clear. And that was the area where you could not go and kill anything. You couldn't hunt, you couldn't kill a, a bug, you couldn't kill a, break a leaf, you couldn't pick a flower, you couldn't, no death could happen. They had to exist the way Mache Manuto, there was a sacred gown. They didn't bury dead there. They couldn't do anything like that. It had to exist the way Mache Manuto has designed it. Only Mache Manuto's hand could touch that. And if you go to this area of Richmond called the Shimaraza Park, that's where the Power Itans lived. That specific tribe. Now, right down uh, where you go down Mechanicsville, Richmond, you have another group of natives that were somewhat independent of the, of the uh, to, to Seneca Mocha, a pow, uh, uh, of Mache Minuto and the Power Heightens. They were called the Chickahominy. But they also eventually aligned with them and became a part of them after they saw how badly the colonizers or the invading English was treating other tribes in the area. Now, what happened was the Power at Athens went down the James River and up toward the York River that splits into the Manapanan and Pamunkey River, named after the two Indian tribes that lived along the whole. The tribes were not just in little clusters like we have cities today. They were long, skinny tribes. If you look at the county of Henrico, for example, there's a long, skinny tribe. That's because, this county, that's because the original inhabitants were scattered out along the distance of the river. So their villages was long, narrow strips along the river. They were basically, uh, Aquarian people, they lived, they were uh, maritime people. The, the word canoe basically comes from the Tsinica Mocha, Native American people from this area. The word tomahawk, there's many words that's in our vocabulary today that come from an extinct language that is no longer fully in existence that actually since the Disney and other movies are made, linguists have been hired to bring back the languages. So guess what? The, language, the languages are back, just like Hebrew has come back to life in the 1600s. Guess what? The Native American Tsinamoka language has come back. How you doing, Octavi? How's it going? I'm waving back to you. Good. Glad you could be here. So basically, this painting is telling the story of when finally Opachi Chicano, and these people were tall and slender. The Native people was tall and slim. I got a lot of tall and slim people still in my family today from grandpa's side of the family, the Mattapanai side. Tall, slim guys with very nice builds. And the women were generally kind of shorter and stocky. That's about according to John Smith's information. I'm not even giving my own translation. I'm actually quoting the colonizer right now. I'm quoting them. <laughs> so, and should I, should I give them that much credit? I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know if I should or not because um, they actually, most of our record comes from the actual invader who basically, what their main goal was to do was to destroy. 
I know they, they say, oh, Thanksgiving, we were trying to be friendly with the natives. That's not true. Their main goal from the beginning was genocide, to wipe out the natives, and settlers for England. Everything was about England. Even when Captain John Smith uh, talked to the king and queen of England, he said, it's important for us to treat Pocahontas or Matoka with certain respect because then that way we can gain all of this country and territory by easy means by befriending Wahantanoka, by befriending her father, Chief Powhatan, real name Wahantanoka. And because he was a very powerful man. Both of these were tall, powerful men, but Opak Chanakana was particularly powerful. He was particularly fierce, and what happened was he did not, he did not uh, trust the English from the very beginning. Wahantanoka was more of a diplomat. He was a warrior also. He was fearsome also, but he would rather try to settle things through marriage and through diplomacy and through trading, whereas Opak Chanakana just wanted to go in with sheer power, force, and solve problems by battle, solve problems by war. So actually, who had the correct uh, path? Opet Chanakano. He was just born a little bit too late. Now, it was said that Don Lewis, the gentleman I was talking to, was an African person, was actually uh, Opet Chanakano. They don't know. The English don't know anything before 1607. However, the Moors, the Africans that was already traveling to the New World, guess what? They did know. <laughs> they did know, uh, have relationships with the natives. There were some people amongst the English who were translators, who was here, who, was, who, who knew some of the more southern dialects of the same language and was able to do some translating. And that's how they were able to set up the abduction of Matoaka. <clears throat> So the way we gained the country was through dishonorable means. The way we gained this country was through lies and deceit. It was not through any honorable means. The way they treated the natives from the very beginning all the way to the end. Now, what happened was from point one, there was wars between the Tsinica Mocha and the evading English uh, mercenaries. These were mercenaries. They were hired by the London Company, which is ran. They didn't even represent the country. They represent people from the London Company that was hired from who knows where, all over, but mostly from England <clears throat> to basically take over this land. But when they became beholden to, they, when they saw how powerful Wahan Tanoka was and how intimidating and powerful Opek Chanakano was, and oh, by the way, the name of Opek Chanakano means he who is bright like the sun who is bright and white like the sun for his defender of his people. That's what his name means. <laughs> so, he, so he had a very powerful name. Uh, now, the translation of Wahan Tanoka, I don't actually, I can't remember that one at the time. That uh, I'm going to go back to my notes and check that again. But I do know the name of Matoaka. And since Opak Chanakano, Opak Chanakano, his name struck me so much, of course, I remember it better. Uh, so... He was born for this, but it is, it is thought by many because the English don't have any record of who, how Opek Chanakano became important. So either Opek Chanakano is Don Lewis's son who married o Wahan Tanoka's mother, they were brothers, or probably brothers. So basically Wahan Tanoka was the old, much older brother. You have that in some families. He was like 40 to 50 years older than Opet Chanakano. So, but he was wiser. Like I said, he preferred to solve problems through diplomacy, whereas when Opet Chanakano, when the English arrived, he was in his teens. He was young and full, full of virile. He was young and full of, 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 he was a tall, big, muscular man. They already they said even um, Captain John Smith's description of both of them was very powerful men that could handle all manners of work all day long. It just wasn't any problem for them. That's how he described their bill. And of course, there is other artists who made etchings and drawings that still exist to the day of not necessarily Opet Chanakano, but shortly after his death, they made one of somebody who looked another native who looked and had a statue like him. And I can see a person with curly hair. The person don't even, I don't know if they had a mohawk and it was shaved, and they had feathers, but the hair doesn't look like the long string of hair on Opek Chanakano. 
So I am led to think, and the complexion was very brown. Okay, now also there is no images of Wuhan Sinoka. And I know they have images of the person called Pocahontas or Matoaka, but in reality, they just hired an artist, a lovely company, uh, John Rolfe, when he was England. She didn't pose for any paintings. They took a painting that somebody who didn't pay uh, and reappropriate in, in, in Europe and reappropriate that person was from southern Europe, like from Sicily or from Greece or somewhere that looked brown. And they reappropriated that painting and called it Matoaka to make her look like a lady. This is propaganda. You gotta remember, they didn't have television then, they didn't have magazines, they didn't have any commercial uh, communication. So the commercial communication was paintings, was etchings, was drawings. So if, if a company like the London Company wanted to spread some propaganda to make the New World seem like an attractive place to go, seems like a place for adventurers to go, and also to promote somebody who was a queen, especially if he had an ulterior motive of becoming a king of that area. And of course, as we know, his children and his offspring became governors eventually. Some of his, uh, John Rolfe offspring became governors in the state of Virginia in later years and later generations. So these people were about seizing power and authority. And guess what? It was successful. And they did it by treacherous means, though. And it was done to the, the demise of the Seneca Mocha people. Now, the Seneca Mocha people, Opec Chanakana was not defeated until 1644 in the war that started in 1644. And he was defeated in 1647. And he was already 99 to 100 years old. And even at 99 to 100 years old, the person who replaced, I believe it's Governor Berkeley hired somebody. I forget who the person was that actually, and what they did was they got, they, they wanted to meet at Powell Height, a place that was known for peace where the Native Americans went. And I'm sure the Colonials found this out early on. It was a place they went to discuss peace. Nobody could kill there, the Natives suspected that. So they were going to discuss peace because this man was older, Opet Chanakano, back in 1607 was just a teenager. <clears throat> but um, by the time you get to 1647, he's an older man. <clears throat> you know, it's almost 50 years had gone by. So he was an older man. So he was somewhere between his 90s and 100s. Uh, they don't really know how old or young he was, but from, from, 2000, from 1613 on, well, actually even before that, because he was coming after them, and capturing them and, and dissing them and being a menace to them even before 1613. So he was tough even at 1607, 1608. I think it's the first skirmish that he was involved with this document. So he had to have been at least 15 at that age. <clears throat> so you can see that by the time we get to 1547, uh, he was already at least in his 90s. So, uh, or somewhere near his 90s, they say. Uh, he could have been 18, 19, 20, but he was a young, strong man compared to Opa, uh, Wahan Sanoka, who died in 1618. So what happened was there was another uh, native named Opet uh, Tekum, who had a short reign, but he basically got killed off. And then uh, it was good that he, or he got voted out or he got switched or somehow the natives knew that they needed Opet Chanakano to be the next premier paramount king in the place of Wahan Sanoka. So what happened was Opet Chanakano became the king. He made all the decisions. There was nobody else. And from that point on, there was non-stop war. <laughs> and that basically kept the colonies at bay. But what happened was, since they had Pocahontas all the way to 1618, that's when she died. She died in 1618. So from the time she met, uh, from the time she met uh, John Smith, which is in 1608, so you can just count 10 years later, she's dead. From the time she met and married John Roth and was abducted, so she had about five years, or well, 1608, she had about uh, five years before she was abducted in 1613, before and so in 1613 to 1618, she only had five more years to have a baby. And not only to have that baby, to go to England and spend a couple of years, and then she was dead five years later. So 
she was not that long lived with John Roth. She only spent five years of her time with him and that relationship was, she spent most of her time in hiding in the Chesterfield area where Opec Chanakano couldn't find her and Juan Hansenoka, none of the natives could find her. So she was hiding somewhere in the Chesapeake area and she basically went off the radar. So from some of that time from 1613, uh, from uh, yeah, 1613 when she was abducted to the time she had a baby, nobody knew what happened. And that she had the baby in 1614. So if she had the baby in 1614, she was 10 years old at 1608. Like I say, she was 16 years old when she had the baby with, uh, uh, no, it's 1613, that's what, uh, five years later, she's 15 years old when she had the baby with, and I know they put her age at 21, but in reality, her age was 18 years old when she died. So how do you learn a language that you've never heard before? I mean, there's people that come to this country all the time, and they take sometimes 50 years to kind of get this language together. So how was she able to say all the things that they said that she said? Because John Roth was speaking for her. All of the information we got about what Matoaka or the person called Pocahontas said was through the pen of John Roth and Captain John Smith. None of those, she never wrote a word. She never wrote a word. She was dictated by some English at her time in England to let you know that the relationship was very bad between Captain John Smith and John Roth because she said, uh, and some English people in England that never been to the New World witnessed this conversation. Her English had improved to some level where she could at least say she called him father. And John Smith was upset because what happened in their culture, you got to remember, an uncle was also called a father because they could marry their aunts. It was okay to marry your aunt. It's okay to marry your cousin. Okay to marry your niece because that's the way the men of power retain power. You know, if a brother of a king was there, went to his sister. And he said, okay, I can't marry my sister, so I have to go back to somebody else that my mother produced and marry one of those women, because that's where the, the, the royal bloodline is. And if I do that, now I can become the king, even though so the guy is marrying his cousin or his niece, or <laughs> perhaps even his aunt. <laughs> so, but it was okay in those days for the Native Americans to do that. They didn't see any problem with that. Now today we do, but their culture was different. So anyway, but they didn't necessarily marry their sisters. So that's why perhaps after Kakum died, Opek Chanakana was interested in Matoaka for himself. So he's in the port, fort, trying to get Matoaka back out of hostage. Because a hostage situation where you're held for ransom is there has to be a price. And their price was time for reinforcements to come in. Time for food and money to come in on ships. They were just bargaining with her for time. And once Wahan Tanoka died in 1618, that very same year on the way back, they haven't even left England yet. They're going down the, what, the Tomes River or whatever that river is as they go out to sea. And they say that she died from disease, but she had met them back in 1608. So she already had all these 10 years to get a disease and die. So why would she die suddenly of disease? Yes, but she was in England for a while. But she was in England for a long time, not just a few days. So she had plenty of time to get sick and die there. How come none of the other natives didn't die? Well, the reason why is because John Roth had been known to poison women. His first wife died, who was an English woman, in Bermuda because it was convenient, I guess, but she died. Mysterious means the same way. Suddenly, she's good, and then all of a sudden, she's dead. Matoaka, she's good, and then all of a sudden, suddenly, she's dead. Because the reason John Roth was headed back to the New World, because he had learned that Wahan Tanoka had died. Therefore, he thought, okay, now it's my turn to be king. I'm next. And from his English point of view, he didn't he understood the matriarch system, but he didn't fully understand it because he had a son. 
He felt like the son would be the next king, and he would be the king, and the son would be the prince. He didn't have a daughter. So, but he felt like he didn't need Matoka. He would be the king. He could change the rules because he's the king. So what happened was he poisoned her. Yes, they were known to do this. He poisoned her, and she died on the ship. That's what happened. Uh, now, her dying of a disease, well, when they got back, her father lived to be 90-something years old, like 92. Well, Hansenoka lived to be in his 90s. So these were long-lived people. No disease racked them. And I can tell you that they said the Native American, maybe for the Aztecs, maybe there were some diseases they didn't have. But by the time you get to uh, these particular natives, I don't think they died of disease. One group has cannon. One group has steel blessed prints. One proof group has steel helmets. One proof has steel shields. One proof has muskets and pistols and all kinds of long guns. A huge military skill level advantage and ability to build forts and all kinds of things like that. Just like there's no buffalo anymore. There was, give me a home with a buffalo roam and a deer and antelope, but there was buffalo everywhere in Virginia. There was antelope everywhere. If you look around today, there's no buffalo except for in the zoo somewhere. There's no antelope. There might be a few deer scattered here and there. You have to look how long and hard. They was everywhere, all over the place. So just like the buffalo is scarce here, the Tacitacomocas are scarce the same way. They simply just shot them down. They killed them off. And they killed them at such an alarming rate because it was a, a word. There's no good Indian but a dead Indian. So they killed them at such an alarming rate, they had to make up the myth because it worked for Cortez, and it probably was had some significance, but they had to make up the myth that the reason these people died is because of disease. How about the reason it's died because these people just mercilessly mowed them down with superior military power? That's most likely the thing, and these brave men, that's why they call them braves, defending their land, ran on the bullets and, and paid the ultimate price until they were depleted. Perhaps that would, because, because for example, the Dacinica Mochas had rocks on the end of sticks as clubs. They didn't get metal orgy. They didn't get the ability to have metal tomahawks unless they traded an ax with the native, with the uh, English. Unless they traded a sword, traded a spearhead, or they traded some pot, a pan, or something metal. That's how they got metal. So they didn't even have metal tools. The bow and arrow tips were made out of rocks. How is that going to penetrate the breastplate of a fully armored colonial mercenary of that time? Well, it was even hard for the Spanish to do it against the English and the French to do it against them. So you knew it was going to be very hard for a native person, basically with no armor on at all, and basically their weapons are made out of stone and wood. So guerrilla warfare was invented by the Tassinicomocas right here in the state of Virginia by the natives. That was their only real superior military tactic was to appear out of nowhere out of the trees and drop down out of the trees, to appear out of nowhere and do a fast swift attack with tomahawks and with spears. They would basically spear, tomahawk, and disappear. And from a distance, they might fire in some bow and arrows if there was a straight shot and they could somehow find a good shot because uh, Opec Chonacano captured Captain John Smith. Uh, back in 1608 or 1609 or something like that, he captured John Smith. And he basically, uh, he killed some of John Smith's men. And what John Smith did was he had a, a boy guide who was one of the native boys. He was his guide. And he was leading them because they were trying to find Wahan Sanoka and Opech Chana Khan because they found out these were the tough guys. So John Smith was going to kill these guys, but what happened was Opec Chicano, again, was much more stealth. He found them. Instead of them finding, except John Smith finding them, he found them, and they filled uh, Captain John Smith up with arrows. But he had so much armor and clothing on, there was no mortal wounds. Even though he had taken in a lot of arrows, there was no mortal wounds, and he was able to heal. As he was healing, he was taken to Wahan Sanoka, and there... They basically liked some of the toys and gadgets he had that they had never seen before. And because they was liking that, they basically allowed their leader, which is Captain John Smith, to live. 
And Captain John Smith was kissing up to them because he already knew he was going to die. He made up this story that uh, uh, Matoaka basically petitioned to save his life. Now, she had already been maybe going near and playing with some of the boys around Jamestown, but she wasn't getting close enough to the adults. <clears throat> and, of course, she was naked, and the boys were just gawking because the, it's hot in Virginia. And the Native women, until they reached their purity, they were basically buck naked. They put an apron on and was topless after they became an adult. But that was it, just like they do in the Amazon today. That's all. That's all they wore. The men was the same way. They were topless, essentially, and then they had an apron on. Oftentimes, in the summertime, there was even no pants. It was just an apron over the loin area, both for the men and the women, if you were an adult. And if you was a child, you was basically buck naked. Uh, unless it was the winter time, then you would be wearing the deer skin, the buck skin, and the pelts and stuff. But for the most part, if it wasn't winter time, and even in the winter time, they really didn't need a whole lot in their uh, homes because they kept a huge fire in front of each longhouse. So those fires produced so much heat, they could still almost stay the way they were in the summer. And that was noted by Captain John Smith as well. They could almost remain <laughs> the way they were in the summer in terms of their attire, which is maybe a little bit more wrap than they would have around them when they were relaxing in their homes, uh, even through the winter months, December and January months. I'm pretty sure in the cold months, they really got inside those buffalo, uh, warm buffalo wool and uh, kept themselves warm. But in the spring, in the summer, and in the fall, for the most part, they just had the aprons for the most part. <clears throat> and so what happened was the English were used to covering everything up. The Europeans was used to everything covered. They had the armor covering everything. To see people running around with no clothes on, and also, with, they, they, they had tattoos. They had body paint. So, and they had feathers and they had animal. Uh, if a person had a bird actually attached to their head, that was a spiritual man. If a person had a buffalo, that symbolized one thing. If a bird had, a person had different headdresses, a wolf meant different things. <clears throat> so, they called them savages. And, John, and, and, and what happened was, Cat John Roth, I can tell he did not. If you look at his, his testimony about his wife, he said, it's a sh some people might think it a shame that I marry a savage. He called his wife a savage. And that he must Christianize the savage. One moment. That's how he referred to her. He must Christianize the savage so that he would be just before God and he wouldn't be living. And even his little testimony he made during his wedding you can tell by his own words that there was some guilt in there about how he was living before the time of marriage. So the, the Madapanai statement, the Madapanai native statement that she was raped by these men stands the reason even by the own testimony of John Roth. You can read between the lines and you can see it. Now, you're not going to see it if you want to favor the colonial settlers. You know, if you want to favor that point of view, you're not going to see it. You're only going to see it if you have any sympathy in your heart to understand the point of view of the people who are extinct that cannot in mass speak for themselves. The people at the time who relied on word of mouth because they did not have a written language at the time. They had totem poles with symbols on it where they could communicate through basic symbols and relate different messages for future generations, but they did not have a script language. <clears throat> so. They basically pass things down through word of mouth in terms of the lineage, in terms of the history of the people. And but the thing about it is the first thing the English wanted to do was to teach them to teach them to speak English. So the Matapanai natives and the Pamunkey natives, as well as I believe also the Chickahominy and certain native tribes, they were very good at basically learning English. And by the time you get to about 1620, maybe 1635. Those tribes could read and write proficiently in English. So, so they started right away to teach the young children. So say, for example, if you was a child and you start interfacing around the time of the abduction of Matoka, because they did have the so-called peace of Pocahontas. Basically, that was not a peace based on love. That was a peace based on just don't kill her. We won't mess with you. 
And that lasted from 1613 when they abducted her to the day she died in 1618 for five years, the so-called Peace of Pocahontas. And basically what happened was every time the natives got, okay, we're tired of this. They keep killing us. And they got, and they was going to attack the fort. They would just simply put her on a high place on the fort, put the knife to her throat, and Wuhan Sunoka would say, okay, don't, that, that's, uh, don't do it. They would back down each time. So that happened for five years until finally the father, the dad who loves his daughter, dies. Of course, when he dies, what point is there having Matoka around anymore? So she gets poisoned. But the son who was raised as an Englishman, and he was also partly educated during the time they sport, spent in England. She was also, he was also educated at some point at Jamestown Colony because they were trying to educate the natives to English as well. So they were getting some type of uh, Englisherization. He was half English and he was half native. But was that a relationship through love or was that a relationship through lust and rape? I'm going to say it was a relationship because all of the motivations was based on the English invading and the English being able to survive. And they were doing very, very poorly. They were struggling. So they were doing surviving by any means necessary. They were using very ruthless uh, means to do it. And not necessarily they were dying from, again, the attacks of Opat Chanakano and the, Opa, and the attacks of Wahantanoka. They basically left them alone. They were dying from starvation. Mostly. On their own account, they just weren't supplying themselves good. They were dying from, this, from mosquitoes stinging them and giving them diseases. They were dying from drinking water that was mixed with seawater, the wrong kind of water that had various germs in it. <clears throat> so they were selecting the wrong water supplies. They were selecting, they, were, they, they didn't have themselves supplied with food. And in addition to that, they had a swampy location with a lot of mosquitoes that were staying them all over the place and giving them diseases. And they were just simply dying that way. So the majority, uh, out of, it was uh, uh, almost a third of the, to a half, I will say a half, uh, to a third to a half of the settlers had died by the time of her abduction in 1613. Some of those, not all of them, some, not the majority of them, some died by the hand of the Native Americans, most notably Opet Chanakano. <clears throat> Whatever the reason, they stayed very close to the, the forts and the ships. They wouldn't go upstream, up the York River, or any of the rivers, the James River, any further than what a ship with a cannon could go. And they wouldn't venture off the ships much. If it was, it was to build a fort. They would run into the fort, and they would try to arm that fort as fast as possible. And that was their strategy. And that was their only strategy, and it was all about mercenary conquest. It was never, the original people here was not settlers. The actual settlers didn't really start coming until 1635. So you're talking about something like uh, 32 years later or 33 years later. Then you have settlers, actually the normal people from England that weren't necessarily mercenaries, but they were people looking for opportunity. Those people came. But you had 30 plus years of nothing but soldiers and mercenaries whose main job it was was to wipe out the native people. Um, with that, uh, after Opet Chanakano was shot at point blank by the, the person of Governor Berkeley, he was just shot because what happened was they went to Powell Height to discuss peace. He's an older man. He was probably decide, look, I fought these English all this time. Wahan Sinoka died. He kept the people halfway safe. He did do diplomacy. I can't go out there and fight like I used to because I'm 90 something years old. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually discuss peace. And what happened was his half brother who was, again, they had a lot of half brothers because they were marrying their niece or their cousin or somebody from the female bloodline. So he was in line to be the next king or he was in, he wanted to be the next king. So he knew that if Opat Chanakano, he couldn't live to be another 10 years old. He was a strong man, even in his 90s. <clears throat> if he was still living, this guy was getting old too. He was around a similar age. So what happened was, that's how he talked uh, Wahan Sinoka into getting on the ship. And also, 
eventually from person from that same tribe, same family, convinced Opet Chanakano to meet them at Powell Height. They had been converted to Christianity from their native religion. It's the first thing that the English did to them. And then, of course, taught them some English. And they started to denounce all their primitive culture as savage. All their primitive beliefs as pagan and, and evil. So these people basically betrayed all of the Seneca Mocas, all the way from Delaware down to the Carolinas, all the way from the Nazamans and the actual Chesapeake's down in the Carolinas, along like uh, Hatteras and all those places. So that's how far Wahan Sinoka's confederation went. That's how far the Seneca Mocas went, all the way to Delaware. Now some of the Delaware people were not from the Wahan Sinoka, but some of them were, all the way to Rappahannock and Tappahannock, all those people. They are all part, and uh, uh, even up to the mannequins. They had a uh, friendly relationship. The mannequins are out in the Shenandoah Valley area going towards there. So that was kind of like, uh, the mannequins was like a cousin tribe or so, but kind of different. Uh, but it's still, there was some partiality. They may or may not been part of uh, Wahan Sinoka's influence. However, they were. Toward the end, they became into Opet Chanakano, when the English started to encroach, they had to all band together because their numbers were getting depleted. So all these different tribes that in the past didn't get along had to start to unite more and become one. And so they were into changing languages. Even if they have linguistic differences, one tribe, because they had to depleted, would join another tribe to build their numbers up so they could fight the English. And they were learning, picking up different people's uh, languages. So what happened was, the person that took Opet Chanakano's, the person who took his uh, place, signed a treaty. No more wars between the Tassina Kamoka and the Colonials. And they basically gave the Colonials all the way up to Richmond and beyond, all the way going to what the area we call Powhatan and Chesterfield. It came from all that area. And basically what that did was that split the Tassina Kamokas in half. So the people going towards Fredericksburg and the Rappahannock people and all those people on one side of the York River got separated from the people from the southern part of the Seneca Mocas that's close going toward uh, Norfolk and North Carolina. They got separated. And literally, the, it, the natives did wear jewelry and armbands, but they had to wear special armbands uh, when they was going through the area that was the colonial area to signify who they were. If they were friendly, if it's not, they were subject to be dragged into court, perhaps killed, or hanged, or suffer some kind of bad penalty. Or what happened was that they spoke their language and didn't speak English. And the English couldn't tell if they were plotting against them or what they were saying. They could be dragged into court. And then they passed a law that said they couldn't even speak their language. If they spoke their language, they would be, uh, so they kept losing rights. And the English kept passing laws. And what eventually happened was their lands got turned into a reservation. And that's how we got the first Mattapanon and Pamunkey Reservation. Those reservations, uh, slowly, depending on which reservoir was in charge, got smaller and smaller. They negotiated smaller and smaller and smaller every time the natives, because the natives didn't understand purchasing land. They didn't understand that everybody shared. They didn't stay in an area that long. They stayed in an area about five or 10 years. They would basically use fire to clear off an area Stay there about five or ten years. Once they depleted the area of game and they, the area wasn't good for, as good for farming anymore, they would pull up and go somewhere else and start and clear off the fire again and start a new place. Well, they, they would continue to do what they've been doing for tens of thousands of years. And what the English person said, well, I just purchased this land. According to the treaty, the governor said, this land is mine. You can't come on this land. So that's where you got no trespassing. So <laughs> Americans don't like trespassing even today. So what happened is, they were simply, if a native was caught hunting, fishing, because they were fishermen and hunters. They were extremely, the men basically were fishers. The women were basically farmers. The women stayed in the camps and did all of the camp stuff. The men stayed away and did basically hunting and things like that and war. That's what the men do. Oh, I got some people waving. Let me say hi. Betty Prince, how you doing? Benjamin Anderson. Cousin, this is your people, the Tassinica Mokas I'm talking about right now. You guys need to pay attention. That's Grandpa. And I'm talking about Uncle Henry, all them people. And uh, Aunt Mabel, 
All of them. And so uh, the story, we're all to Senate Camocas, because what happened, what a lot of people don't understand, in 19, around 1920s, 1930s, after, well, after the Civil War, what happened was some of the Tsinnakamoka natives, um, because the Moors were already mixing with the, the natives of the East Coast. The reason why the child talks of uh, Alabama, Georgia, different, they look so brown, they look like they're mixed with black. The reason why the Okagichis, or they call the Kichis, look like they're black or mixed is because they had been doing that before Christopher Columbus, before 1492. So you can see natives that was already very brown, that very look much, perhaps even like African people mixed with what we call Native American phenotypes. We saw these type of people. So what happened was, again, I go to the person Don Lewis. Again, he was a Moor from Spain. He was an African person from West Africa origin who migrated, I don't know how many years his family was in Spain, it was, they came, and the first Africans that came to Virginia was a captured Spanish ship full of African people in 1619. So African people, for example, Captain John Smith and the first Englishman came in 1607. It was only 12 years later, only 12 years later, so you had a shipload, I mean 200, 300 Africans. That makes it more Africans than, than English because half of them had died. So if the original English came at 200 strong and then half of them died off, there's only 100 Englishmen and then probably a certain percentage of those were Africans that was living in London. African people was all over the place because of the Moors before Christopher Columbus Day. Again, you can Google this. Pedro Alonso Nino discovered the Western world showed uh, Christopher Columbus and they discovered Jamaica. <laughs> and there were Moors. There was, you can go to Jamaica right now. It's a group of people called the Maroons. Maroons. And that's where the word Maroon comes from because what Christopher Columbus did was after these African people who were sailors that was from basically Spain, but they were African. See, Spain was Africa at one point. <laughs> Just you know, it's a little straight to Gibraltar. Not that much distance. You could paddle a rowboat from one side to the next. Now, matter of fact, that's the one, talk about build a wall in Mexico. That was one of the first wars, walls that was built after they kicked the Africans or the Moors out because that's what they call them, Moors. That's who Othello was. <laughs> after they kicked the Africans, that was the old word for Moors. Before that, the word for Africa was Ethiopian. And the word Africa does not come from Africa Scipicanus, the Roman who basically conquered uh, who conquered um, Hannibal. Hannibal was an African guy with dreadlocks, big lips, big nose, and everything. Uh, there's coins with his face on it, so I know that's what he looked like, because that's what the coins look like. They tell you that he was half Arabic. Well, he visited there somewhere in Syria for a little while, but that wasn't his nativity. So anyway, make a long story short, Moors are all over the place in Spain. Don't believe me, go to the southern part of Spain, and you will see it for yourself. <clears throat> uh, however, Don Lewis had already befriended the Virginia natives, and who knows how many Africans he brought over well before 1607. The English came online, and we started getting records, because we speak English. Everything we learned in our history books is from the John Smith's point of view, who was a mercenary, bent on genociding one group of people, and actually had slaves right there on the ships, the original ships he came on, who was from Africa. So these were enslavers and they were genociders. Both John Roth and Captain, nothing good from an African point of view or Native American point of view, nothing good about them. Uh, from a colonial point of view, from an Englishman point of view, well, we got all this uh, domination of these two groups for the next 300 years because of them. Thank you. That's why they're important. But are they important to everybody? No. Maybe after... 1865, thank you, Abraham Lincoln. Maybe it started getting important to African people. But of course, for, for the Native Americans, it wasn't because, again, around 1920 to 1930, what they did was they passed the law. Emancipation had already happened. But people who were claiming to be Native Americans, if they, they sent a census around. And the census was, if you look too brown, 
You was classified as black, African. They call it colored then, Negro. There was no middle, but there was a middle. You was, if you almost could pass for white, you was a mulatto. Or if you was a light native, you was classified as white. And they call that paper genocide. That's what the Matapana natives call it. And certain other natives that still survive today in the state of Virginia, some recognized by the state of Virginia, some not. Already the federal government don't want to recognize the first nation that they destroyed to make a country. They don't even want to recognize it because by recognizing it would mean that they got this country illegitimately. <clears throat> However, the bottom line is they passed that law. And that's the most important thing for people of color, especially if you can trace your generations in this Virginia area, but anything over four or five generations, most likely you have some Native American blood in you. Now we know the African gene is very strong. So maybe the Native American blood didn't carry over that, that far for you to see it in a phenotype like you see it in the Midwest and you see it on the West Coast. But culturally, these people had to escape the slavery of the colony. They had a fort. So if the African person could escape the fort, they would join the Tisinicamocas. And for generations after that, they would take on the Tisinicamoca name. And, for, and that's why it was a law, another law was passed in the 1600s after this Opak Chanakano was killed. And that's why they start not naming people Native American names. You had to take on an English name, or what they call a Christian name. So if you were caught, you only could name, and I have people in my family who have nicknames and certain names like that that are native names, like Tonka. And I happen to know Tonka comes from Taka, which basically basically means uh, little power tan. Basically means little power height, little power tan. <laughs> That's what it means. And uh, it's like saying junior. Like junior flesh in my flesh or junior family man or junior native, you know? Tonka. So I'm, I'm surprised at that nickname like that. <clears throat> I don't even know how, if it was even by my ancestors that are no longer here, I don't even know if originally they knew the full name that I think there was nicknames that was passed down until their, name, their meanings became obscure, even by the people that would give them. But what happened was this law was very severe. If you was caught using a native name or if you was caught speaking a native language, you were killed because Africans were escaping. Why well, escape 600 miles to New York somewhere when all you had to do was escape six miles or 30 miles to where the, Indian, the Native American border was. And I don't call them Indians because Indians live in India. They are indigenous natives of this land that we now call Virginia. That's what I call it. If you really want to call them something, they were the Tassina Kamoka. That's the name of this country before the English renamed it to United States of America. Well, at least it was the name of Virginia before it was named actually Elizabeth City. And then Elizabeth was spoke called the so-called quote unquote virgin king, queen, but she wasn't. And so they called it Virginia after her. <laughs> you know? Everything these English did was a lie. And of course, the images, the, every image that you see of Pocahontas looks different. Whenever you see an image that looks different, that means that the person never existed as a picture. They don't have an image of this person. Nobody knows what the person looks like. They made a propaganda picture so she can look like a lady, a, 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 a queen. They wanted her to look like somebody that the English and the Europeans could accept as a royal so that John Roth's family could inherit the state of Virginia. Just like William Penn and the Duke of York inherited New York and William Penn inherited, inherited Pennsylvania, which basically states after their namesake. And King George, Georgia, these states are named for the namesake of these people, but also because these people spent a lot of money to get English people over here. These people were the main people. In the case of the Duke of York, it was the Dutch who had basically taken over New York. And they had to basically hire a navy to fire upon the Dutch. And the Dutch just gave up and said, okay, we're English now. That's why you got names like Rockefeller. Those are Dutch names. So even the older, if you, you was one of the first people here, like John Rolfe, you became governors, you became important people. The Rockefellers didn't really do anything industrial. They controlled the furs. They controlled the, 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 because there was no more animals in Europe, especially England, which is an island. They killed them all off. They depleted their land of furs and timber. So it was very important to get the timber 
in the first. They made a lot of money just cutting down trees and sending it to England and getting the pelts of animals and sending it to England. It was a bunch of money for that. <clears throat> so that's how the Rockefellers made their initial money. And because they were the first ones here, they became the, the organizers, the leaders. Everybody else that came in after that, they were already, the families had already became like some of the leadership in those areas. In Virginia, the Roth family became, and certain other families of notable name, but the most notable is the Roth family became the leaders here, just like the Rockefellers became the leaders in New York. And you can see we got two presidents based on that. So the English was about setting up bloodlines to control from that point forward in the name of England, not knowing that a hundred years later or so, they'll be fighting a revolutionary war for so-called freedom from England. Because what happened was they made so much money off of the lumber. And of course, what John Roth discovered was tobacco. The Native Americans had tobacco. They would use it for religious purposes. Calming effect. Make you feel calm, cool, and collected. You could discuss how the nation is going to go. And John Roth saw it was addictive, saw it was pleasant. And what he did was he introduced it to, he basically was the first drug dealer uh, on documented drug, drug dealer on planet Earth, who was John Roth. He basically cultivated an English farming style with long, big fields of nothing but tobacco. Because the way the Native American woman, who was the farmer, did it, they had a garden style, patches. They grew the corn, the tobacco, and the squash and various other native uh, plants. These were at least three native plants of notoriety. They grew them together in one mound sometimes. And so that was not the way the English did it. The English just planted just tobacco fields, just corn fields, just squash fields, etc. So John Rawls started the first plantation concept. He was the first plantation master. And of course he did it with slaves, African slaves. So let's get these people straight. Let's understand that these are fiends. These are not necessarily good people. I'm going to just tell the truth. I'm not explaining anything bad. I'm just telling the truth. How you doing, Yvette Smith? How you do? Good to see you. So this is what this painting is about. This painting is one of few paintings about the Tassinica Mochas. And this, is, this painting, I'm doing on this piece right here, a plaque that says, James Hill Colony, Tassinica Mocha Natives, Matoaka abducted and the year that she was abducted 1613 I'm doing that to help teach history so since this painting will become a rare painting because there's not that many paintings done there are small drawings that was done contemporary to the time and that's what this painting is based on I'm going to paint a series of painting about the Sinica Mocha I'm going to do the one where she was betrayed and put on Captain Argyle's ship and by her, by uh, another neighboring tribe that was adversarial to Wahansanoka, but still was friendly but deceptive because the king of that particular tribe had married Matoaka's half sister, and they that king and that sister actually was trying to get power, whereas Kakum, and actually Kakum was going to be the next king by Wahansanoka. Kakum was going to be the next king, not Opakchanakano. And Matoaka was going to be the next queen. And they were going to produce a daughter. And guess what? They produced the daughter. Uh, and that daughter, her name was kept secret. And she was kept secret. And I believe the descendants of that daughter is still exist in King William County today amongst the Mattapana. I believe the descendants of Matoaka's rightful daughter exist. Not... Thomas Roth, the son, because that's not how the divine bloodline of the Seneca Mocha go. That's how the English way go. But that doesn't count if you're going to use the, the, the original people's way. It only accounts if you use the English way. And since John Roth was not royal, he didn't have any royal to pass down to Matoaka. <laughs> he didn't. So that wasn't going to work. So, um, But Kakum had already been murdered by the colonials. Or either the colonials hired some natives to murder him. Either way, he was killed. And the persons who directed the murder of Kakum were definitely the colonials, whether they did it themselves outright 
And I imagine since they got to her, they use a native to get to her. I'm sure they killed Cocoon shortly after abducting her. So perhaps they used the natives to get to Cocoon and then they either shot him with the long rifle or they had the natives to do it or use whatever means. But that's not really said. The only thing that's said in history uh, journals is that he was killed. It doesn't say who, when, where, or how he was killed. It just says he was killed. So, but we do know that who had the motivation for him to not be existing anymore. That would be John Roth and Captain John Smith. Because that would mean that you're going to get a brand new young king. You're going to get a brand new young king. And then that young king was going to live another, because they were long-lived people. In my family today, they live to be 80s and 90s. So, so they were long-lived people. So if you look up Opec Chanacano, that's O-P-E-C-H-A-N-A-C-A-N-O-U-G-H. That's the way... The English spelling, you can take the O U the U G H off of it if you want. Opet Chanakano. <clears throat> you will find pictures of Opet Chanakano. And if you look up images that they think might have been uh Wahan Sinoka, you would see that these people look much different than the natives that you see pictures of today. And these are people contemporary to them drawing the pictures, people who are, are actually artists. Who, because they had translators here too. They came for conquest. Now you gotta remember, these guys were propaganda rising. So when they got back to England, when Captain John Smith got back to England and John Rolfe got back to England, it was very important for these images to be put in front of the royal courts, in front of the various people of influence, in front of the, in front of the aristocracy. These English were, they would come to these prominent places and people would come gather to see what was what the natives look like, what was going on. It's kind of like us today with the Apollo missions, going to the moon. Everybody's glued to the television or the Mars Voyager or whatever, the, 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 the expeditions to Mars. Everybody's glued to their screens like, oh, wow, this is some really wild, interesting stuff. So everybody wanted to know what was going on. So they had artists here making drawings. They, uh, Captain John Smith has a map today. You can go on, on eBay and find the map that he was making with a list of all of the tribes. So it was way more than 31 tribes. The reason why it's more than 31 tribes, each of those 31 tribes had within it a sub-tribe. Basically, of families, of multiple families who made up a tribe. Now, of course, the tribe is an English word. These people didn't call it such. Basically, it was like a name. So basically, you were, the way the Native Americans did it, your, your, your super tribe came first. That was, if you had a name, you were Tsinnakamoka, for example, then if you were part of the Matapana, you was the Seneca Mocha, Matapana. And then if your sub-tribe was, say, Mango Hick, or if your sub-tribe was Arohatek, that's what you, that was your name. And then they would, you would say your name, last. So they didn't have a first, last, and second name. Their last name was their ultimate tribal name, and then it got down from there to their sub-tribe and to their family tribal name, to their family name. So that's how it was done. And so... Therefore, that's why they had multiple names. That's why her name was Matoka. So her name would have been, actually, uh, Matoka was part of the Pamunkey tribe. Guess what? So was Opak Chanakano. He was part of the Pamunkey tribe. Now, does that mean that they weren't intermarrying with the neighboring tribes, like the tribe just across the other side of the uh, peninsula, the, uh, the York River Peninsula, the Mattapanai? Yes. They had family members from the Mattapanai also. But for the most part, at that time that the English showed up, um, Opachanakano's mother was from the Pomonki. Uh, and actually, Wera Komoka, to be specific, which was affiliated with the Pomonki. So, again, all these tribes was kind of intermixing. So they lived in Wera uh, Komoka, but he was buried amongst the Pomonki as a Pomonki leader. He was he was he was Pahai he was Pahai and he was Pomonki. Both of these people could be king. He was the king. He was from the Pahai tribe. He was from the Pomonki tribe. But the confederation was not just the Pahai They were just one tribe, one major tribe. The confederation was multiple tribes that were called the Tsinnakamoka. So she would have been Tsinnakamoka, Wesakwerakamoka, Pomonki. 
uh, Menuet, or actually uh, Matoaka Amenuet. That would have been her name, <laughs> full name. So they had multiple names to describe who they were, and that's how they described who they were. Hello, I'm uh, Kim. I'm teaching about the Powhatan Matapanai, which really uh, teaching the history of that. So you might have to rewind this live after it's over to get everything I'm saying. But um, I'm painting a painting now that's basically called the M Abduction of Matoaka. That's a person that we call Pocahontas. Again, if you took Spanish and you know Latin, you know what polka means little. And you know hantas in Greek means wanting woman. I'm going to say it the nice way since you're my sister. Uh, so no Native American would call themselves new Latin or Greek. And they wouldn't call themselves little wanton woman. They would call themselves Matoaka. That was her name. Which basically means the womb of the queen because the bloodline went through the women. The bloodline did not go through the males. So even though the male might have been tough, he had to basically marry his grandmother's sister. <laughs> one of the grandmother's sister because the grandmother had the bloodline and any one of those women had the bloodline. So you had to marry through the female line. So oftentimes, even though it was a brother of the king, he had to still go back and marry a niece or somebody like that or an aunt or a cousin or somebody <laughs> to get to be king. But they would be elected also if they was um, strong. And what you have to remember is that the Wessawanks, that was the name of the king. There was no such thing as chief. They were called Wessawanks. And of course, the actual king of kings or the emperor, who was the king of multiple tribes, uh, he had a special name. So uh, he was not called necessarily the paramount chief. Because that's what, uh, but Captain John Smith called him an emperor in his journal. So it was clear that he was treated like an emperor. And basically his, his, uh, his full title as the king was, uh, of course, he was a military leader as well as the all, basically the commander, the overall rule of everything. But essentially uh, he was called the Mama Atnawik. The, 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 the Mama Natawik. I'm sorry, the Mama Natawik. That meant paramount king or emperor. So the tribal leaders say, for the, 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 the king of the Matapanai would have been called the Wessawarks. The king of the Arvibadi would have been called the Mama Natawik. So, uh, and his, he would have been, they would have referred to him as Mama, uh, Mama Natawik was Wuhan Sanoka. That's how they would refer to him. And then they would refer to him as Pau Haidt Aten. That's, it was no, so not Pau it was pronounced. Pau Haidt is the Bon Air area of Richmond. Again, they could not kill anything in that area. That was a holy land. It was not where they buried their dead. It was a holy land that had to be the way nature made it, the way the hands of Wuhan Sanoka, that was the name for, I mean, uh, Meshe Manuto was the name for God. So, Basically, it means the great spirit that's nature, that's everything. So it had to be the way nature made it, the hand of Moshe Manuto. So they would go there to discuss peace. And so the place overlooking Pau Height was called Pau Height Aten. Basically, Pau Wow means place. Wow means gathering, so gathering place. Pau Height means place, holy place. And then Aten means Overlooking the 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 the, the, sun, the 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 sun, how you say it, the, the sun shining on the holy place. That's basically what it meant. And actually, it was called Powhatan Hill. Now I don't know the name for hill in the original Tsinikamoka language, which comes from the Algorian uh, ling language. So the language had it dissolved in Virginia. However. The, the natives around the Lake Erie and, and toward Canada, going all the way down to Norfolk, some of those natives actually spoke a dialect of the Tsinikamoka language. And after several movies was made, linguistic people were hired, and they were able to rebuild the language. So it is possible to learn the original language of Matoaka, the original language of Wuhan Sinoka, and the original language of Opechanacano. So that's how we know their real names today, and that's how we know we don't just have rivers and streams and geographical places named after the Sinecomocas, but we actually know that they were not called the Powhat. Now the Powhatans is Church Hill. We used to live in Church Hill. So the area, and what the English did was instead of it calling it 
Pahai Acton Hill, they found out what the English word meant, you know, at Shimmerazza Park. You just go to Shimmerazza Park. That was Pahai Acton. That was the view. And you look toward the sun setting. That area is Bonaire. That's the holy place. So that's where, that was where Wahan Tanoka was from. And his actual house was located right, they, they think, based on archaeology, that it's right there at 6495, right at that junction. That's where his actual, one of his living places were. But his whole tribe of the Powhai Atens lived right there at Shibaraza, going into Churchill, overlooking everything. So, because the king, that's where he would be. He would be overlooking as far as he could see down to James, as far as he could see up the, what they call the James River. Again, the original name for the James River, people from Richmond. The original name for the James River was, guess what? Powhite. <laughs> we have a, a road that's named Powhite. That was the original name after, guess who? Powhite Aten. And that was not Powhatan's name. That was the tribe he was from. So if somebody was to say, if somebody would say, if a, a colonial would say, take me to your leader, who is your leader? They would say, to Seneca Moka, Powhite Aten, Wahan Sudoka. That's what they would say. So, again, the Englishman is not going to listen to, to Seneca Moka. That's a whole lot to say. And then Wahan Sinoka. And then found the Powhai Aiton. And then since Powhatan sounds like Powhai Town, it was easy for them to say, oh, Powhatan. And they call all of the natives Powhatan because their leader was from his main tribe was from Powhatan. For example, my last name now is Foreman. But then everybody knows the Native Americans were Andersons. So even though I'm affiliated with the Andersons, Powhite was affiliated with the Pomoki and the Matapanai. But he comes, the leader comes from by way of Foreman, which is the Powhites. However, that doesn't mean that the, big, the biggest population was in Churchill. It was a large and substantial population in the Churchill area, which is Powhite Hockton Hill. The reason we know that all the way up to about the late 1600s, early 1700s, it was still called Powhite Hill until finally they put a church on it and they named it a Christian name. And they said, okay, no more paganism because these people worship nature and the sun. That's why we had a Thunderbird. That's why we have the Eagle today. That's why we had a Washington Monument in the Kemet tradition. That's why a symbol is the same falcon as Kemet because that's what the natives had. <laughs> and all they did was make the bird of the country the same thing that the Seneca Mochas had. And the Thunderbird goes all the way down to Mississippi, Louisiana, all the way going to the Southwest natives, all the way down to Florida. The Seminoles simply means semi. Again, the same thing started to happen with the Seminoles, except the Seminoles didn't get defeated to guess who? Andrew Jackson. Where you had escaped African slaves join the natives with Spaniards actually blending in with them. Guess what? Those Spaniards weren't Spaniards like we know. They were Moorish uh, Spaniards that spoke Spain, but they were African Moors. And guess what? Some of the African Moors had European, or we consider to be Caucasian, comrades with them. And they were the original people that became the Seminoles. It was a mix between the European Spaniard, the Moorish Spaniards, and uh, which the, the, the Moorish Spaniards were African, and the natives. They were getting along and trading peacefully. There was no problem until the English showed up in Jamestown. And again, a Spanish ship was there was fighting. Now, was the Spanish ship necessarily, we've seen Paris and the Caribbean, was the Spanish ship necessarily a, sp a Spanish ship? Or it could have been a Spanish a sp ship from Spain, captained by Moors. And then when they arrived, they saw people looking like the Moors because Opec Chanacano was the son of Don Luis, the Moor from Spain who had married into the royal family years. And we don't know if he was the grandson or the son. We don't know how many generations these Moors had been producing children amongst the Tassinicamocas. Because when I go to look at the Garrison family with Henrietta, uh, Arthur Anderson, when I go look at them, I said, they some, they're kind of some brown looking, straight wavy hair black folks. <laughs> but when I start investigating the history, especially around the, the, the 1920s when they passed that law, if he was a brown-looking native, 
who probably intermarried with a few too many escaped Africans because the Native Americans didn't know, they didn't have any, they didn't distinguish black between white. They weren't concerned about that. Once you joined them, you was one of them. The English was the ones who made the black-white thing an issue because it was about people who had already had the land, who felt they owned it, they felt they could go anywhere with no deeds. They didn't understand deeds and ownership of land. And so it was very important for these new English people to grab land and get rich because they left everything behind them. They were, most of them were peasants in England. And they were in England, the aristocracy had all the land, they had everything. This is a chance for them to get land. This is a chance for them to go somewhere with their lives. And they were granted, given. They didn't have to work for it, they were given land. Now, some people had to work for their voyage. They became indentured servants. But all of that stuff about everybody is indentured servant, uh, and that was, that, that's not true. They had already had African slaves from the get-go. There was no indentured servitude there. They were slaves. What you had was the people who weren't slaves were people who were, um, <clears throat> who people who had escaped and joined the Seneca Mochas. So you had about three or four or five generations. We know what happens in three or four or five generations of mixing. The kids can look like anything. The offspring can look like anything. Hey, Arthur Anderson waving. How you doing? How's it going, cousin? Another Tacena Kamoka power, power, power tan, Manapurnai person. Because once you join the family, you're no longer what you were. That's what they, that was their, their laws that they made up. Once, because they needed to survive, they had to adopt as many, many of the English ways as possible for them to start working in metal because they were working in stone, for them to start working and making money. And what happened is some of the Eastern European people, today that we call white, because of that law in 1920s, if they actually did a DNA test, they found out they got 15%, up to 15% African blood in them, and then 15% blood unknown, that's native blood. And the thing about it is, you can't go to a, a dead native's grave from the 1700s and, and do their DNA and say where they're from because what happens is that probably is a mixed person by that point. The native, the Seneca Mochas have became mixed, but however, the thing that kept them together was their language and the culture, living like a native off the land. Fishing was very important. If you go to count counties like Gosser County, Tappahannock, West Point area, you find some of those old families, they're fishermen, they're native people. Some of the best fishermen, they get some of the best uh, crops and things from the, um, from the bay and from the rivers that you've ever had. They were just expert, and they've been farming that for passing that down their family for hundreds of years. But in order to be a renegade, in other words, leave the reservations, many families had to leave the reservation so they could own land, they didn't learn the English way, so they can literally own land and keep what their families had already had freely to share amongst each other without paying any bills on it, any taxes on it. They all of a sudden had to start paying what you call it. And that's why we got personal property tax for the Commonwealth. So what they call it, the Commonwealth of Virginia. The reason they call it the Commonwealth is because this particular phenomenon that I'm describing now that happened. So a lot of people from Virginia that call yourself African-American, you could also make a claim for native because if you was a native in 1700, for example, in 1800, even up until the time of the Civil War, you could look very African looking and have all the rights of indigenous Native Americans <clears throat> as the first nation within a nation. And it wasn't until this person in the 1920s, I forget what his name is, but he served 30 years on the Virginia board and basically what his goal was, that's a long time, and he was very adamant about writing off. Anybody who was light enough, they got classified as white. And anybody who was too dark, they got classified as colored. Anybody in the middle, some of those people was listed as mulatto. Well, my particular grandparents were listed as mulatto. They were somewhere in the middle. However, there's many others that was not, that's, that was originally to Seneca Mocas or Powell Heights, whatever you want to call them, Powell Tans. They looked African, they had all of the rights, and then suddenly, in the 1900s, a lot of their rights was taken away. And of course, the subsequent generations, that information was lost. It was just lost. So a lot of people who call themselves just 
black today, and I don't know why we call ourselves by color, or African American, two con well, America was the guy who thought they was in India, so they call him India. He was an Italian map maker. So African America, that's a continent. What is it? Are you from Nigeria? Are you uh, Benin? Or are you Ife? Or are you Togo? Or are you Yoruba? What are you? <laughs> you know? So, um, but we call ourselves that because that was all stripped away. It was stripped away from the native as well as the African. This was done on purpose. Their lineage was recorded. Our lineage was not recorded. So I would say DNA test is very important for people that's native, that's lived, have generations in Virginia for any time. To go get your DNA test and also to go petition what I consider the people who are Madapana, Pabunki, and Chickahominy, and Nessima. It's a lot of different tribes that still exist. And start rebuilding that group. Start joining that nation because uh, of the fact that these people were of mixed looks by the time you got to the late 1600s, early 1700s. Um, some of the people who survived the best were the people who were some of the more mixed people. So uh, that is uh, a bit of not just family history, but that is actually Virginia history. That is the phenomena, the real phenomena that happened was a certain group of poor people from England came here and they, they started, because the first people, when you look at some of the old governments, there was black people as governors. You know, people said some of the first people before there was, uh, uh, before there was uh, George Washington, they were black. Sure they were, <laughs> all over the place, especially on the East Coast, because of this exact phenomenon that I'm talking about now, where you had the African joining with the natives to have protection so they won't get persecuted, so they can actually live and then also, sometimes you will have, like the Scottish, my name is Anderson. That's from Northumberland, England. You had certain Scottish men that did not necessarily get along with the British, with the English. So when they came here, they saw what happened in Scotland was happening again here. And they had sympathy on the native, and they intermarried with the natives, and they taught the natives. So you have a lot of Scottish names uh, that came during the Jamestown era who blended with the Native Americans and guess who else? The Africans. And they became a lot of the people of what we call the Tidewater area. So you can see and say, well, look at yourself. Well, I just look black. I just look African. However, if you have lineage that you can tie to this area, and if that lineage is to Seneca Mocha, I would say you have a claim to be a first American as dual citizen, as well as a normal American, whatever your classification that you want. I don't even see why you have to have one. But anyway, when that law was passed, that effectively got rid of all Native Americans. So they didn't die of disease. They died of paper genocide. The last thing that was done to them, they had blended so much and became so diverse. They still had their some, some, some Native culture that they erased them by saying, you're white now. Of course, that's what is invented. White is an invented thing in black. Negro, means, it means, Negro means black in, in Latin, <laughs> was invented. Caucasian also is another definition that was invented. It was invented by making power structure. The people that's called this is going to have power, and the people that's called that is not going to have power. <laughs> what is that? And... Um, so therefore, you eliminated all the natives that could have a claim to the country right there in one lump. There was no way you could ever go back in time and make a petition because they would start to fight world wars. They didn't know what was going to happen. So it was very important that some of the local people wasn't going to say, hey, look, we get some rights, man. We get something going here because we deserve something because we were shackled on the one hand and then we was genocided on the other hand. So, of course, it was necessary to wipe you out on paper. And now you have people that just call themselves, they're proudly called, I'm just white. You know, then you got people say, I'm black. And the problem with that is you eliminate the fact that there was another group of people here who were the original people who you could identify. You didn't have to identify with just American or a colonial. They really have a real name. What is American? American is also South American and Central America. What is the United States? I'm a Virginian. Well, United States. So is this a country within a country? The state of Virginia is a country unto itself? States' rights? 
so to speak. So you can see the confusion there. So basically what happened was this painting is about the very first conflicts being resolved. Major conflicts between the British. Of course, the British wound up losing everything by, 16, by 1812. They lost everything. They fought their last war. They, I mean, of course, by 16, 17, uh, uh, 76, of course, you guys also see my, my painting with uh, James Amistad. You can Google him as well and find out about him. We wouldn't even have a country if it wasn't for another person from New Kent County, from the same area along the York River, Mattapanine Monkey River. He's an African person. He was with Lafayette. He's a person that made Lafayette famous. Google him. His name is James Amistad. He changed his name later to James Armistead Lafayette in honor of the only European person that gave him the right respect. These are important things to know about your history because there's a lot of stuff I see since Donald Trump has appeared on the scene about go back to Africa with this person and that place. Suppose I tell you before the English was here, the Africans were here. The African Moors were here already. Peacefully interchanging with the natives all the way from Florida to Maine including the Tsinemoka uh, Powhatans, including that confederation, which is a very powerful confederation because Powhatan was known all the way to West Virginia, all the way down to the Alabamas, all the way up to the Lake Erie area. So, <laughs> including these people. So, you have to put stuff in context of history, and that's why history is not told the right way, because you're never going to get the correct knowledge because that would mean that we have to do a cultural shift. That would also mean that reparations might be in stuff. That, means, that might mean that the Holocaust was honored, the, the, the Japanese people who were disrespected during World War II was honored. That might mean that the Sinamoka and the, the, the African people from Virginia should be honored as well. <clears throat> so with that said, I'm going to go back to uh, just painting. I like to do my first few minutes, it's just been a little bit more than a few minutes, doing the history part. And then I'm going to put this on YouTube also, so uh, eventually it will get on YouTube, but you can always play it back on Facebook. And what I'm going to do is start mixing my paints up and get ready to get set up for... Uh... Now, I don't mean to be offensive to anybody with what I do. I like history. But I do speak history from my point of view. <laughs> because the reason I'm, I'm bold about doing that, because there's so much history from other people's point of view, and they're bold about that, and they refuse to tell history from another point of view. And sometimes you have to counter that. Sometimes you have to appear to be a little bit off, a little bit intense to counter that properly, or else... Nobody, it won't have any weight. People won't take what you're saying seriously. And you have to make sure that you draw the points. Now, all of the points that I'm discussing here can be Google. Research on Google. Matter of fact, if you don't want to go to Google, go old school. Just go to the libraries. Go to the Library of Congress, even. The governmental libraries. There's, go to, go to uh, William and Mary, one of the uh, Ivy League schools of Virginia. Go to Harvard. Go to any... Let's go to Oxford, for example, a lot of this information, especially for the Roth family, they have a lot of information in England, so it's impossible for the Americans to have buried Pocahontas. That's why it's important. That's why we can't forget Pocahontas. That's why they had to put it up there, because what John Roth made the mistake to do was try to make her famous. And in making her famous, he could bury Opet Chanakano, because nobody knows who Opet Chanakano is. And he could even rename Wahan Sinoka to Chief Powhatan. <clears throat> of course, they never call him King Powhatan. They call him Chief. Because King would imply, especially after John Roth's plan didn't work, King would imply that um, the, the actual king of this place is actually the descendant of Kakun and Matoka. So you can't call somebody a king. You must call him a chief because a chief means that you don't have any inheritance. You're just the, the, the chief, a boss, a family uh, head of a certain family of people. That's all you are. You're not a nation. But I'll say the reach of the Tsenica Moko is basically just the same size as the state of Virginia. Now the boundaries was a little different because it went as far as Delaware into the North Carolinas. It didn't go into the 
Western, the, as much of the Western mountains, because they did change to the Monacans, which was a different native tribe, and then some other tribes. They were still cousins to the Tsinakamokas, but they weren't under uh, Wahantanoka's confederation. Uh, towards the end, though, all these tribes had to band together. Now, if people say, well, I'm from the Cherokee, well, guess what? The Cherokee is just a displaced Tsinakamoka tribe. After Wahantanoka was killed, all his natives were basically Wahantanoka met at Powhite, and the natives were treated to alcohol because they started getting the people gambling. The natives didn't know anything about gambling. They introduced that to them. And alcohol. They didn't know anything about alcohol. They introduced that to them. And, and what they did was gave them alcohol and they had basically a little... Because with the natives, if you cooked a big meal, that was a sign that you was trying to make peace. So that's where the whole idea of, of, of Thanksgiving came from. Uh, what you would do is invite someone into your domicile, into your main village, and you would have, and what the natives did every day after all of that work, the women worked the farm, the men would hunt. But at the end of every day of doing both of those things, the men and the women would get together and have a big dance. Every night was a party. And it's noted that they would party just as hard as they work. So, and it was noted that these were very athletically built people. They were very, because of the vigorousness of their activities, both they played hard and they worked hard. They had very, very strong, doable bodies. Um, but they had a party after every day, and then they would go to bed. And then they would repeat this every day. So it was a very festive area. They would have uh, dancing and storytelling. Now, during the summer months, the Tsinica Mocha was not supposed to tell certain stories about their certain things. But they could tell certain other stories. And But during the fall and winter months, and I think the reason why is that they didn't want the young ones to waste time. They needed to plant. They didn't want to party too much. They needed to plant and grow the crops so people could eat. They needed to go hunt. So during the summer months, there was it was it was said that... Uh, According to the uh, Matapanai natives and certain other natives in their uh, records of the culture and places uh, of natives that kept culture, during those months, and according to archaeologists as well who's done the research on this, they were not actually uh, uh, engaging in storytelling. But, uh, but they did engage in some dance and some, party, some uh, music, some festivities. Now, what the instruments were. Uh, also, feathers had very much significance with the Native Americans. Feathers meant things that were messages from the heavens, messages from the gods, or from Moshe Minuto, from nature. So different bird feathers, if it would land near you or if a bird would sing a song near you, that was a communication between you and heaven, or you and the heavens, or you and the uh, divine, you and the universe. Uh, so it's very interesting once you start getting into Native American cultures and what they believed as well as how they behaved as well as their ideas about land. Nobody could own land. They didn't understand that, the concept of ownership. So what happened was they passed a law that if a, if a native was trespassing, the colonials could shoot them on sight without any repercussions whatsoever. Just shoot them. And so a lot of natives died that way because of the long guns. They're out in the field, just doing what they always done. Not necessarily attacking, but they might have had the bow and arrows hunting something. And that's considered a weapon. And they were fired upon and killed. And like I say, there was a, a, a message that says, no good Indian, but a dead Indian. <laughs> so just to let you know, so um, I'm going to go into my painting session more now because sometimes it's just easier just to talk than to paint. But I'm going to still paint and I'm going to still teach history. But anyway, the, the, the Paramount King was called the Moma Na Wick. Cats.
Oh, by the way, when Opec Chicano was found and killed, he was shot at point blank, discussing peace at Powell Height. He survived that for his divine name. The, the natives thought he was the divine leader, and they saw that as a sign. When he was killed, that he was shot by the colonial and survived, and he had evidently was starting to heal from that. They paraded him through the colony. Once he was, he was an older man, like in his 90s, they paraded through the colony. And then they said, the natives, it must have been some people partial to him, but they said, look, he's a divine leader. He didn't get killed, even though he was shot at point blank range. He couldn't be killed. And one of the guards said, oh, he can't be killed, can he? And he went and shot him in the back. And that's when he died. And still, he didn't die right away. He was able to say, if it was I who caught you, instead of you catching me, I would not have paraded you in this mockery and in, in, in this mean way in front of my people. In other words, he would have killed them in private. <laughs> Still would have killed them, though. But the way he was treated was very bad. It's much like uh, Jesus was treated and mocked. Much like uh, Cleopatra, when she came to Rome, was mocked and treated. So... The same thing wind up happened to Chicana Kana. Once he lost his power, he basically, uh, once he lost his men and he was an older man, they basically stopped respecting him altogether. And from that point, there was not a good leader that came up amongst the Tzedemoka. All of the leaders after that basically became sellouts. They basically wanted to get all of the things that the English had or they just got tired of uh, having to fight. They thought that the English would give them a break. The reality is the English didn't give them a break. They just kept taking and taking and taking. So they kept signing these treaties and hope that the English would, would chill out with the killing, you know, would just go easy on them. And so they gave up so much. And oftentimes what they got in place of what they gave up was absolutely nothing but a promise. So the name Fork Tongue, that's what that comes from. Basically, Fork Tongue is a snake's tongue. Basically, what it means is that you'll say one thing and really mean another thing. You never said the truth. You always said things with two meanings. So uh, the word for that was uh, Gogola, I believe. Basically means Fork Tongue. So... Uh, very often, that's what happened with the natives is that in all their negotiations, it always ended in, uh, it always ended in um, them basically losing negotiation or losing more, I should say, losing more, uh, losing more territory. And then uh, ultimately the same territory was given to a colonial settler. Now, not sold, given to. So there was definitely a, a system of genocide going on. There was definitely a system that was based on taking it away from the native and giving it to the colonial person. So a lot of what the state of Virginia is was owned by the Tsenicamoka people and owned by certain tribes. Uh, what a lot of people don't know, there's a, a, another historical, because Church Hill is now a historical African-American community. But before that, there was another African-American community that the 95 is going over today. They put the interstate right through that area. And I believe the reason why is the same people, they knew the history. They knew the old history. And that's the problem is that I remember I went to the local high school in my area because um, I was at that high school and a family member was attending that high school and I went to the um, the history teacher there and I said look um, why do you teach uh, about power, uh, uh, Pocahontas being called Pocahontas when you know her really name was this and you know that all this history is different and he knew the history that I knew he knew that I knew what I was talking about and he said, look, I know that you are correct, but I cannot teach that history because the history that I have to teach is the history that's approved by the government. And 
if I teach anything different, I could be reprimanded and I could lose my job. So he knew about the history that I'm talking about. And many actual teachers in college, they know what the historians and the archaeologists know. But they have to teach the propaganda because the propaganda fits the uh, fits the uh, the image of America that is promoted uh, by our, by the what I call the American aristocracy, which is a hidden group of people who basically uh, is passing down from one generation. The real information of what I'm talking about and what they're really doing is they're not passing it down they're covering it up and it's not all the time what you know that can help you is what you don't know that can hurt you so again I would think and I know also that I know some people from a certain area and I've done the research on their family there was a person who was of ambiguous ancestry just before the Civil War, and he was a free so-called person of color. Now, whether this person was light-skinned, dark-skinned, I don't know. But he was a person who was mixed with at least white. And what happened was uh, somebody thought that he was a little too not white to be free. And he didn't have his, because he got his freedom from his mother. And his mother was free. And a lot of his siblings and family members were free. But what he did was he wanted to leave his area too much. And in leaving his area, he was pressed by a new immigrant from England who was a shoemaker to basically work as a shoemaker for free, as a slave for this guy. And there was a law that if you found somebody of color that didn't have paperwork on them, and they didn't have any paperwork to say that they were to Seneca Mocha or that they were white or somebody who was allowed to be free, then you could press them into slavery. Not indentured servitude. You can press them into slavery. Now, what he wanted was in order for his shoemaking business to survive, he was really dependent on free labor. Somebody working for nothing. Now, he had the expertise from Europe, but what they've been doing was the Native Americans wanted to get the expertise because they found out, well, I can't hunt anymore because these English are all over the place killing us. If they see us show up with our bow and arrows and stuff, they're going to shoot us. If they, if they uh, suspect this, that, and the third happening, they're going to shoot us. So... We have to have a way of making money that won't get us killed. And that way of making money was to be something like a shoemaker or some type of furniture maker, to take on some type of apprenticeship with someone where you develop a certain European skill. Now, not a native skill like hunting and fishing. That that's how they made their money for generations, by hunting and fishing. You had to take on a European skill set. In order to get these, that allowed the, the new European settler from England to make money. And he didn't have to make money through doing the work himself. He made the money through uh, teaching somebody else to do the work. Who basically, at first they had to earn their way out of, uh, into their freedom. But then it got to be to the point, if you was a certain complexion, you couldn't even earn your way into freedom. The only way, you was their person for the rest of your life. As a matter of fact, not only that, if they found you, they didn't have to purchase you. All they knew they had to do was just find somebody that couldn't get to their parents, that couldn't get to somebody that could prove that they had a relative who was European. If you couldn't get to somebody and prove that you had a relative that was European or perhaps native, uh, you could get pressed into slavery. Now, 
This is what happened in reality was if you were too brown, if you were a child that came out, you know, a lot of people, African-American people know you get the same parents. One child comes out rather light complexion, but then the other child comes out relatively dark complexion. So if you were one of the children from a native and a white or a native and a white and an African who just happened to be a little bit too brown, you could get pressed into slavery for life. You could get caught by somebody not having a connection to your people and not being able to prove that you was actually a freed person. You could actually get pressed into slavery somewhere else in another county, generally, on isolated plantation or isolated community for the rest of your life. Never being allowed to live. So it's very important to have plantations and reservations. Because if you had these areas you were not interfacing, you couldn't go and petition anybody. If you got caught this way, you couldn't leave. You had to stay right there in that geography because if you left and didn't have your, your proof of who you were, uh, again, somebody else could find you. You could see this happen with um, a lot of people. If you read anybody's like uh, Harriet Jacobs, read her. She has an audio book online. She was a person of mixed heritage, and she struggled for her own freedom. It wasn't just very, very Af dark African people. It was everybody. And it didn't matter uh, if you were native or if you was white or African, if you just looked too dark. And I believe even with Sally Hemmings, Thomas Jefferson's second concubine, I do not believe she was the half-sister of her sister. Because what man would actually, uh, or what family person would have a, a, a child by an African slave and another one that's by their white wife, and the white wife is cool with it, or vice versa. A white woman who has a child with her husband who is fully English, and then have an African, you know, father. And the father is good with it, and the two children are still friendly with each other. No, what will happen is the woman would be very upset. The white mother would be very upset that the man cheated on her with an African slave, and she would have the, both the African slave, she would sell both the, 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 the half-sister as well as the African slave. They didn't want to just give them away because it was worth today in today's currency millions of dollars. So they would sell them to another person. So they wouldn't have to see them anymore because there was value there. And that's how they became, a lot of these white women became very rich in their own right because they were the ones who arranged the sale of a lot of African women who interfaced with their husbands in a sexual way. They just had to get rid of the woman because the husband was going to keep going in there because who was stopping them? They were out there in the woods by themselves, on the plantation, wherever they were, in a remote area. He was the boss. He was the king of kings there. <laughs> so the only thing she could do was get with some neighbors or get with some people and in the still of the night have this African woman who was uh, who probably not because she wanted to but who was in relationship with her husband had her whisked away in the middle of the night and have the, the, the child also so in order to basic, basically have in order to basically have a uh, a daughter who stayed in contact with her sister, whereas one is full white and the other one is half white, you probably had somebody who's both of the children. Uh, Thomas Jefferson's first wife was probably light complexion, but she could pass for white. And the other daughter, Sally Hemmings, was a full sister to her, but couldn't pass. She was just, she just came out a little bit too dark. But who was the one that Thomas Jefferson seemed to like the most? Who had the most babies with? The brown one. <laughs> okay, so therefore, Sally Hemmings 
was uh, which just like Matoka, Salah Hemmings got taken to Europe too and paraded around the, the aristocracy of Europe by Thomas Jefferson. These guys are very emboldened. They didn't care if she was a slave. And of course, what they did was um, on the top, the person appeared to be a servant. But in private, the person was a little bit more than a servant. And that, that's how it went. Uh, that's the reality of the thing. And so this was not just something that, if this happened with some people that's as prominent as Thomas Jefferson, you can imagine going down the line with the lesser uh, educated people and with the, uh, with the common person. This was something that was common practice. This was not something that was, uh, especially in the early years, gotta remember there were no English women. When, when John Roth was here, there is no record of any English women too much, you know? There might've been one or two but I believe all those women were African women. And if they didn't want an African woman, they was going to take a native woman. So a lot of your original so-called people in Virginia might not have been full uh, British at all. They might have been uh, African. and also native. Again, Manomatoic was his real title. He was also a Wessel Warrens as well as a Mamamatoic. That's the Paramount King. That was their name for Emperor. So all that stuff about Chief, that's also a put down. That's just like the name of, uh, of, of Pocahontas. These are all words so that they can't be seen as anything but savages. So they can be seen as not having an organized government. So if they don't have an organized government, if they are just some loose confederation of savages, you can easily come in and make a claim that, look, we got to tame the savage. It's, it'll be very hard for you to come in and make a claim that, uh, okay, we have to make some kind of agreement with a, with a sovereign nation. See, that's a whole different thing. If you have to make an agreement with a sovereign nation, that's a whole different type of uh, agreement then if you come in and just a bunch of savages is here. Because if it's a bunch of savage, primitive savages, well, not just primitive, because primitive is, is primitive a behavior issue or is primitive the amount of techno war technology you had? I mean, one group had better war technology, but they behaved like barbarians. They behaved like violently toward people. Their behavior was savage. Their behavior was uh, evil and cruel, like a savage. So uh, it depends on your definition. It depends on your point of view. Now they say history is told. His story is told by the victor. And in this case, in this case, the victor was the English colonel. And in the case of our history. It is almost always told, especially by the James County Colony, by John Roth, the rapist, John Roth, the enslaver, John Roth, the genocider. So let's just be clear about that. Also by Captain John Smith, <laughs> the enslaver, Captain John Smith, the genocider, Captain John Smith, the rapist. That's what these people were. There is no other way to translate who they were. These were not noble men. They didn't do anything of honor that we would consider honor today. 
They are not to be mentioned amongst honorable people because they did nothing honorable. They were basically hired thug mercenaries. They're more, more or less the English mafia is what they were. Essentially, that's what they were. They behaved in the exact same way as Cortez. Again, he was a Spanish mafia. Okay. Uh, any uh, reference to these people as anything other than that is 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 a is a diss to the Native Amer original Native American people, and is a mockery to history, where history is skewed beyond beyond recognition of what it actually was. So even by their own records, they were so they didn't think there would be in a situation where they would have so many slaves come to this country. There was no way they had a crystal ball, and they could see that this slavery thing we started, it's going to get huge. And in getting huge, uh, we're going to fight a war over this eventually, and uh, we're going to free the slaves. See, they didn't have any idea that would happen. They thought slavery was there for since the 1500s, and after they kicked the Moors out of Spain, it was always there in Europe <laughs> since the beginning. So they felt like, oh, you know, this is going to exist forever. It's going. This is the way it is. We're entitled as Englishmen to take the whole planet for ourselves. That's John Rolfe's thinking. That was Cortez's thinking. That's all these people's thinking. They was thinking, okay, these people are tough people now. Well, we gonna we can take this from them. We just got to trick them out of it. And I just think it very interesting that my family still has land right on the same space that a lot of the wars that the Tsinica Mocha had and a lot of the spaces that these ancient Tsinica Mocha people lived on. Still the same places. Farming, doing exactly the same things, even into the time I was born, that the Native American to Seneca Mochas were doing since before John Smith showed up. I just find that fascinating that I have family members that I knew, Creed, Native American name Fonny, Native American name Henry, which is not Native American, but still, he looked very much Native American. <laughs> they were farmers. And then his father before him, Creed the first, Sam and Elizabeth Petros, 100% Native, Native American. Elizabeth Petros had a name like Elizabeth. She was 100% Matapana, uncut, even to that date. And I have her born somewhere around the late, the late 1970s, early 1800s. Uh, according to her, of course, she was uh, she owned land, so they're documented, and so their births are somewhere in there, or they're at least their, the year doing a certain census is listed, so you can, you can figure their birth days from there. But then also going back another generation to John and Sally, who were born in the, in the 1700s and who lived in the exact same lands that my family still lives on today, in the same area that I have many cousins and family members and parents and sisters and brothers living on today and owning, including myself. That is amazing. I think that we have maintained that through all these years. And I think what a lot of people do is they discount that heritage because they don't know anything about it. All they know is perhaps the African-American part of it or the white part of it. They don't really know because, again, that paper genocide was so effective that it basically, in effect, erased the whole people. And that future generation just had to call themselves. I remember um, I heard the story of Uncle Henry. When he went off to fight with the, uh, in World War II, he was placed in a troop with the white 
officers. Now, if you know my Uncle Henry, he had cold, straight Native American hair. I mean, absolutely straight. But he was a dark-skinned fella. His complexion was chestnut brown. I mean, he was <laughs> very dark. He was darker than a lot of people that consider themselves from Africa. Um, however, his hair texture was like somebody from India. It was very straight. Matter of fact, it didn't even have any too many much curls in it. It didn't have any curls. It was just straight, like a Native American's hair. And uh, when they got him there to England and they were waiting for him to go fight, this is the story that I hear anyway, uh, that um, they didn't know what it, they said, how in the world did this guy get in here with the white people? Because according to the, uh, the King William uh, Courthouse and Registry, he was not African. He was not listed. His father was not listed as African because his father was very fair complexion, but he was very brown. So he was listed as Native American, 100%. Uncle Henry was not listed as African. He wasn't listed as white. He was listed as Native American. That means that my grandfather, his brother, must have also been Native American, if that gone by that standard. Because what happened was when they sent back that this is the US military in World War II. When they sent back to the courthouse, they said, You indeed can go run on D-Day with us. Because you're actually not black. Because the black troops, they had to separate you. They put you somewhere else. You couldn't go and die with the, with the white folks. That's a funny thing. You're going basically to die. Everybody knew there was a, a large chance you will not going to make it. So it didn't matter. You just couldn't go die with the white guys. You had to die with just the black guys only. That's how perverted this country was. And then if you get upset about that, people try to blame you because you got knowledge of this now. No, oh, I deserve to know my heritage, just like everybody else deserves that. And if this is the truth, then it's the truth. We have to all embrace that. You can't just take things because it's convenient. And if it's hurtful to somebody, it's equal as hurtful to the people who that's their history. That's their ancestors. Their ancestors must be that suffered, must be respected. Their lives must be respected, just like everybody else's lives was respected. Their memory of their life struggle should be remembered just like everybody else's were. Why is it that one group people get to have their memories and culture and history intact? Because another person's history is painful to a certain group of people, their history don't get to get talked about at all. It's taboo. Some people will get offended with you just for knowing, for stating your own history of stuff that actually happened. Or just you being having the knowledge of that and speaking on it. Well, I think that's silly and I think that's wrong. And I think it's important for, pe for all people to, to embrace the realities. I mean, we're living in 2020 now. You have all these different groups of people in the country now. You have all these groups of people in the country. And I think it's very important for the first people in this country to be recognized properly before that history becomes so obscured and forgotten it's just not fair that certain people's history get to be forgotten simply because they're the ones that probably deserve the most respect. And since the other group of people disempowered them, they get to go away forever. And then here's these other people that just got here. They never learned what the truth is. And in many, many terms, they get more privileges than others who were decimated. I'm not saying that one group is more important than the other group and that other group is not important. I'm not saying that. I'm saying before we can move on to the next steps uh, in this country, what we really need to do is honor and make the history right. 
respect. I'm not saying do anything so much in particular, but at least honor and respect the, the memory of the original people by at least telling their story correctly. I mean, that doesn't take any energy. It doesn't take anything away from anybody. All it does is makes things right so we can move on. I mean, I have my grandma used to say, tell the truth and shame the devil. Grandma Mabel used to say that. And I think that's the truth. I think what you need to do is tell the true history, no matter how hurtful it is. Yes, the devil is in that history, but it's a true history. And then, only then can wounds heal, and only then can the record be set straight, and only then can you actually have only then you can actually have a true reconciliation where people can move into the future with some type of healing, with some type of uh, knowledge of truth and some type of understanding of who everybody is and how we respect each other. As opposed to one group of people always getting all the respect and the other group of people always getting all the disrespect else you're going to have constantly uh, one group of people forever or it's going to become a normal for the power group to persecute the disempowered group. And why should that be? Why should it be that we have a, a power group always dominating the disempowered group? Why can't we have a group where both the majority and minorities get along in peace? Get along with, with mutual respect and dignity. And that starts by acknowledging people's history. It starts by acknowledging people's history. And only by acknowledging people's actual history can you have true respect. Otherwise, all you're going to have is a group of people who want to feel comfortable and don't want to fess up to what things that perhaps their ancestors did. Now, I know some immigrants came later. Some white immigrants came after World War II. They weren't even here during the colonial period. That doesn't mean that, that they should not also respect the Native American history. That shouldn't mean that, 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 that they shouldn't have knowledge of the things that happened. That just means that you came later and this is what happened before you came. And, and you know, uh, that's the true history. And, it, and we wish that you can respect that history. Because in respecting the original history, first of all, all these atrocities that happened in Europe. I mean, this stuff, these things are going to repeat. This stuff happened. All the gypsies and the Jews were rounded up in Europe. And genocide was perpetrated on them, much like what happened to the Native Americans. So why did that happen in Europe? Because guess what? It happened in the Americas already. See, it was happening in all the Americas, South America, Central America, all over the place. <laughs> so it's not strange that it would also happen again with, with the so-called Nazis in Europe. It was normal. I mean, how can we criticize the Nazis doing Auschwitz and the Holocaust when here we are with the same thing going on in America. It's just that since we're on the opposite side of the field shooting each other, this group has to be demonized, but the other group is saints. Well, maybe both group was bad. Maybe both group was demons. It's just at that time, one group was the winner and the other group was the loser. Of course, guess what? They were losers. They get to be made like demons and everybody else is going to be angels and cherubims. <laughs> you, know? you know? Funny how that is, isn't it? So anyway, um, what I'm doing now is I'm just slowly painting in. Because you can see I have three big ones. I got two pot. This is big too. This is 40 by 60 inches. This is 60 by 90, this is 100, I mean, this is 69 by 103 inches. 
And I, this one right here is 40 by 60. I have so many other rooms that's 40 by 60. So I uh, have quite a few paintings all over. You could possibly see quite a few paintings here. So, and what I'm doing is I'm just slowly painting in. Uh, and this is my blocking layer. Now I'm going to um, stop talking as much about, because I do used to have before, I used to have in certain rooms where I would kind of teach a little bit of, um, <clears throat> I would teach a little bit of painting technique. But I like teaching the history too. I like the history. I've always liked history. And, uh, and so, uh, and so therefore, yeah, I'm really, really interested in history. But when I actually go to look to see that my actual family has involved in so much American history, like I said, my uncle Henry, uh, they had to send away that, you know, he, he was, he could go fight with the white people. The reason why was since he was classified as a native, he was actually classified as a Mattapanai native. He was not even classified as mulatto or mixed. He was in the, um, when they went to ask who he was in King William, he was Mattapanai. They thought he was from India, literally. I can see why they would call him Indians. I think my uh, Uncle Henry was not so much untypical of what the original natives looked like during the time of Captain John Smith. I think that, I think the native, they spent a lot of time in the sun with no shirts on. Now, I had some friends when I was in college and what they would do is I go, we'll, you know, they'll take the shirts off during the summer, be out there getting a tan. They couldn't stay out there any longer than a good 15, 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes before they had to crawl up out that sun. They had gotten dark enough. And if they stayed out there any longer, they was going to start to blister up a bit. And there wasn't no sunblock back then. These guys could put on sunblock. You know? They could literally put on some sunblock and some copper tone and deal with some stuff. But during the time of the Native Americans, how are you going to run around with no with no uh, copper tone or sunblock or anything on and no shirt on whatsoever and still be uh, not affected by the sun at all. So I'm thinking that the Tosinica Mocha, many of the East Coast natives, especially where it's very warm at, with some very dark complexion people. And when you do see photos or drawings of paintings of the Native Americans, they have some very, very dark complexions going down, going down the pipe. So uh, this is why my theory that, of course, since we don't know what a 100% to Seneca Mocha look like today because they got written out. And the only thing we can think is that there's a few handful of people who call themselves still, and those that live on a reservation still, but those are from the areas that call themselves Native Americans of Powhatans. There's a few of them left. If we assume that they are 100% Native American and not European and not African and not anything else, I mean, we won't get a, a, an exact, we won't get exact information there because the reason why is because they did, due to the force of a hostile group of people coming in and raping and intermixing and sometimes friendly marriages. Uh, uh, I think what happens is you start losing any pure to Seneca Mocha blood. So it becomes hard to find somebody who's living today or somebody whose bones you could find and do a DNA sample to kind of go back and see who was originally to Seneca Mocha and who wasn't. And then during the time that they 
that the English came, were they already mixing with Africans already, the, the Seneca Mocha, or were they not? That's going to be very difficult uh, to, to grab that information. It's going to be very difficult to grab that information uh, because you would have to be able to prove that this person only married another Kisenamoka for X number of years. You would have to somehow be able to verify that. And since there is no real way to verify that, uh, unless there's some isolated group, again, that's documented that they never, ever mixed. But then how do you know how much mixing happened before 16, before 1607 uh, between the Moors and the Native Americans? See, we don't know. And of course, the original Moorish bloodline comes from West Africa. The same place that later other African slaves came from. Very similar places. So how are we to be sure of any of this? How do, how do we be sure of this? Is that possible? That uh, that could be found out. So for that reason, I think, uh, for that reason, I think that uh, every person, again, of color, or even a person who is white, who calls themselves white, because we call ourselves a lot of things. That ain't necessarily what we actually are, but society has it that we call ourselves certain things. We might also be able to call ourselves to Seneca Mocas and power heights and power tanks. And I would rather, instead of calling myself a person who grew up in a, an area called Churchill, Richmond, I'd rather call myself a person who grew up and Powhite and Powhiten Hill. Just personally, if that's what it was originally called, and I have knowledge that it was originally called that, why not just call that place Powhiten, Powhiten Hill? Why not? Especially if you were born there and you lived there. Would you not be a native of Power Heighton if that's where you were born? Especially if you didn't get a fair shake from the European people who occupies this area. They don't, they don't really want to acknowledge you correctly with the right respects and dignities. You might not want to associate. So you might want to associate more with heritage of power heightened. People always say, let's remember our Southern heritage in terms of, if you can remember your Southern heritage as a racist ex-Confederate who wanted to keep people of color enslaved, then why can't I remember my heritage as a power heightened who wanted to keep my land? Why can't I? Why is it that only you get to be <laughs> person who remembers a certain heritage, but everybody else get got, only can get categorized as a descendant of a slave only. Suppose I want to go back in history further than that and say, well, what was I before I was a slave? I was a power heighten. I was a Tessinica Mocha. I was the owner of everything you see in the state of Virginia. Okay, so where are my monuments on Monument Avenue? Where are my uh, statues? Where's uh, Wahansanoka? Where's my statue of Opec Chicano? Where's my statue of Matoaka at? You got statues of A.P. Hill all over the place. A guy who wanted to keep certain people enslaved, but you don't have one statue of Opec Chicano. Chanacano. You don't have one statue of Wuhan Tinoka, and you don't have one statue of Matoka. Now, on the, on the seals, we got this fake Indian head because they don't know what she looked like. And then they still calling her Pocahontas. They're not even 
even though we know in educated circles, we know that her name was not the Pocahontas, is a dis name. They wouldn't even name the military ships Pocahontas because they knew it's a disrespectful name. But yet, this certain county that I live in still calls her Pocahontas. Why? Again, I, maybe I don't want to call the river the James River after King James, the enslaver. The person who ratified in England, who made it legal for all English to own slaves. Yes, he passed a law in England that said English all over the place. In Australia, English in India, English in Africa and South Africa, Shaka Zulu people, all them people. You can own them. <laughs> English that's in Nigeria you can own them King James and then at the same time we have a Bible that the same king who sanctioned slavery this is the part that I really have some, some issues with the same king who sanctioned slavery wrote the Bible literally literally that Bible was not written by no Greek. That Bible was not written by no Hebrew. There wasn't even a Hebrew name. Most Jewish people that came here after World War II spoke Yiddish. There was no, there was nobody speaking Hebrew. Hebrew was reinvented, a reinvented language, just like the Tzinnika Mocha language. Die, if it was a language, the Hebrew language, if it was, because there was the Canaanite language. And what they did was they went back to the Canaanite language and they went back to the Hebrew language. I mean, they went to the Aramaic language and they went to the Syrian language and they reinvented a language called the modern Hebrew. But, and they said this is the ancient language, but if they get the little shards of clay they find that said that's Hebrew, you'll find out that's actually Canaanite. Not Hebrew at all. It's ancient. It's archaic, ancient Canaanite language. So they said, well, Hebrew come out of the Canaanite language. Well, not really because a guy from Poland and a guy from Russia who was Jewish made the language up in the, in the late 1700s. And they were only teaching it amongst the uh, rabbinical Jews. That's the, in, in their schools, their private schools. Then once they got a country, they started being sure to teach that in the place they now, that used to be called Palestine before 1948. And they started calling that the official language. And they started teaching that amongst not just the rabbis now, but then the average, they made it the, uh, the national language. So they started teaching it to the children. And of course, the children are all my parents age now so they grew up only knowing this new invent newly invented language but the language is not that old it's only one to two generations old that's it maybe three if you include the rabbinical uh jews the, the actual priest it may be four years old but if you include the common person one or two generations old that's it facts so uh you're not you don't have an ancient hebrew i know a lot of people think you do and i think somebody discovered at one point where if we are truly an ancient people we should have an ancient language how can we speak in yiddish and yiddish is a dialect of a germanic tongue it's a germanic comes out of teutonic germanic languages that's where yiddish come from it's german like polish kind of german so uh so uh, how were they ever in the Middle East with that language if every single person that calls himself a Jew is speaking Yiddish? Now, some of the people in Spain were speaking a, a few phrases in a, I believe, in a, a, a language from uh, what we call today Syria or Turkey. And... Uh, it had some Canaanite in it because that is central to that region and some elements of that. 
But by and large, the people spoke the regional language, which was they lived in Spain, they spoke Spanish. And if they lived in uh, Italy, they spoke Italian. And if they lived in uh, Germanic areas, they spoke Yiddish. So what I'm saying is that uh, King James went to the Greek book and went back to the Alexandrian Library and he re completely rewrote the whole book of Deuteronomy. Just go check it. King James rewrote the whole book of Deuteronomy. On his own, Europeans wrote De Deuteronomy. So it's not just Deuteronomy, it's a whole bunch of other books there. And then we say, well, that's the word of God, written by the ancient prophet. How ancient were they? The Shroud of Sharon, fake. Okay? Uh, the spear that's, that poked Jesus in the side, fake. The, the Hebrew religion, I mean, the Hebrew language, fake. And the King James Bible, fake. It's, it's not actually the same. I mean, there are about thousands of different versions of the Bible. And none of them actually agree with each other. None of them. And depending on which country was the one who owned that version, for example, if you went to the German version before King James got to it, it says one thing. That's the one that uh, Martin Luther was influenced by. Then if you go to the Roman Catholic, they have uh, 81 books. King James only has 66 books. So even if you count the books, who gave people permission to cut out some books? <laughs> Who gave them the permission? Well, under what authority? So you can see that certain people felt like they had the authority to literally write the Bible because they've been writing it all along. They made the, the, the laws that everybody lived by, including the laws of slavery. In the Bible, there's a whole bunch of verses that support slavery. Tells you to be good to your master, just like you would be to God Himself. Yes, it does. It says that loud and clear. And so, what God that created Saturn and Jupiter, and Mars, and all these places, create the DNA and create the plants, created everything? What God would actually say? It's all right to have some slaves. Just don't. As long as you, if you kill a slave, just be sure to pay the master. Whatever it is you owe them. That's what God said. Don't believe me. Just read it. That's what it says. It's all over the place. I can send you links to it, but I don't really want to waste my time if you're too lazy. You got to do that for yourself. Most people are too lazy. So what I'm saying is uh, <clears throat> uh, King James wrote a lot of messed up stuff and put it in the Bible to support slavery in the New World. Likewise, not only King James, but guess what? The Vatican itself, the Pope itself, was writing a whole lot of new stuff so the Europeans could make money by going into countries more primitive, have more primitive military than they, they had, and taking over, and jacking everything up, and taking over, man. That's what they were doing. And uh, they had the dag on pass the laws so they can get away with it. And there was no law. The law was the Bible. I mean, much of what we have in, in, the, in our Constitution is based on the Bible. So you can see that before they were, before you had a House of Burgesses, before you had a Parliament in Europe, before you had the Magna Carta and all that stuff, all you had was the king. And the Bible. <laughs> That's it. Just to let you know where all your actual laws come from. So if they was able to control the Bible, they was able to control the people. So you can see how it was used. It was control, used to control the masses so whoever the king is could stay on the top. 
And not only could he stay on top, so he could make a, a whole lot of money while he was on the top. And so all of the people who was working for him could make a lot of money because it's important for him to allow people to make money because they supported him. So there was, a, uh, there was a whole cycle to that thing where all these people wanted to keep this stuff going so they can, you know, everybody can stay in power and everybody can stay happy. That was, that was very important. Now, that whole story about Matoka risking her life for Captain John Smith is a complete lie that John Smith told later. His first journal that he submitted to the royal courts mentioned nothing about Pocahontas sacrificing her life to save his, nothing at all. Something like that, you would definitely mention that to the important people in your first journal. You wouldn't omit that out at all. But it was only because he didn't know that she would become famous during the time of her visit. Pocahontas was, they said that that church burned down that she was buried in. I think when she was poisoned, she was just thrown into an unmarked grave somewhere near a certain church and if she was a princess, she would have been getting a very important funeral. Pocahontas got no such an important funeral. They didn't even stop the ship. They kept on sailing on down, the, on down the river. They took, they stopped enough to get her off because she's a dead person. They didn't want a dead person stinking on a ship the whole time. So they got her off the ship and buried her in some unmarked grave somewhere. And then later, at a later date, they said, well, the church burned down and we don't really know where she is because that's how you fix history. That's how you fix history when you actually, a person becomes famous. Then everybody said, where is Pocahontas at? I mean, she died in England. Let's go see her burial site because we're Americans now and they made Pocahontas famous. So we want to see where she is. Well, she actually, uh, the church burned down and and we don't know. And the church might have burned down, but that's a convenient excuse uh, to hide the fact that she had a very, she, there was no ceremony. Nobody writes about any ceremonies for her burial. If she was truly a royal, there would have been some type of uh, official acknowledgement of a funeral. After all, she was a Christian, right? John Rolfe, it was very important for her to be a Christian. So the Christian that who was a princess was definitely not going to get buried without a proper funeral. That just won't go happen. And so since it did happen, I I even I even criticized the fact that John Rolfe considered her. I don't think he, I think he knew that she was never a Christian. Because if it was, he would have been sure to give her a proper Christian burial. Because what Christian would want to be buried in a very improper way? Because they're a Christian. They want to be buried in a Christian manner. It's very important. And that's what Christians do. But in the case of Matoaka, that didn't happen. They just simply got back on the ship moments later and went on back to Jamestown and went to collect all of the stuff that was due to John Roth. Because there was no Juan Tanoka left. And now it was time for him to make good on a lot of them territories that he claimed for himself. So he had to get back to that and get that money. He had to get back to that and get that. That was very important. So with that said, uh, that's exactly what he did. He made a beeline back for that um, for that property and uh, it won't even that much more mention of, of, of Matoaka or Pocahontas the only mention we get and matter of fact his son the son of Pocahontas was not even mentioned as that much he wasn't famous in his own lifetime you would think that somebody of Pocahontas' statue especially since the English was the patriotic system in other words to the man and he was the son of John Roth through Pocahontas. He must have been important as he was living in his lifetime. He must have been a very important person to the coloners because um, 
Thomas Roth was um, the son of Pocahontas. However, he died very unimportantly, very uh, obscure. He was uh, basically a nobody. He didn't become, he also was used just like Matoka well after his death for certain people when they wanted to make a claim to a governorship. They would just say, hey, look, I have a, a descendant, an ancient descendant, and that descendant's name was Thomas Roth. Therefore, I'm one of the, well, they had the word that was called the founding fathers. Well, I'm one of the, uh, the first families of Virginia. And therefore, politically, I'm running for office, and therefore, you should, you should vote for me because you wouldn't even have a country if it wasn't for my, for, for, for Matoaka giving it to us, <laughs> essentially. And did she actually have the right to give it to them? No. OPEC China Kano had the right to give it to them. Pocahontas had, was never actually a queen amongst the, 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 the Seneca Mochas or the Matapanai or the Pomonkey. She was never a queen. She was only the person to give birth to the next queen. And she never got a chance to make good on that according to the tradition of the natives because she didn't marry a native. She married John Rolfe. <laughs> so therefore, the native tradition is null and void because it was not used on Matoaka. The only thing that was used on Matoaka was perhaps if the king of England would have decided, hey, yeah, I think I do want to marry into the, the Seneca Mocha uh, family and try to get a legitimate claim through blood, through marriage, because the they must have already made a baby and the baby turned out looking mostly white because I think they thought this was definitely a way to go in terms of getting the legitimate claim to the Virginians because you literally could have some English looking people by intermarrying the Seneca Mochas uh, with just the English and therefore the natives might eventually, because, you know, the natives weren't gone right away. They was all the way up to the 1800s. Many of them are still existing today. So they weren't gone right away. And uh, they did get some of the sellout natives toward the end. They get, did get some of them to, uh, now I'm not going to say sellout, because they might not have had much of a choice, you know. You know, is it either keep on getting killed and jacked up or just quit? And I think they just decided, you know what, enough is enough. And we're losing and people, we're losing bodies, we're losing family members. And we just can't take it anymore. And I think they just uh, gave up in terms of being able to fight them. I think they just decided to quit. They decided that it was not worth it to keep pursuing war as an option. I think it, it just became too, too big of a price to pay. So I don't want to say sell out because if you don't, something that's decimating your people that severely where they actually literally disappear must have been very, very intense to go through in reality. It probably was just as bad as the slave thing that was going on. It probably was the suffrage was just as terrible because you just had family members who was here one minute and shot down the next minute. And the only thing that you could guess is that he must have trespassed or broke some kind of law that the English had that he wasn't, or most of the time it was a man that was killed and women would just simply raped or intermarried with. So uh, in often situations, uh, you know, you had little isolated co rural communities at that time. The communities weren't big, big cities unless you was in Richmond. And uh, you didn't have much recourse, you know. What was going to happen to you happened. And that's about, that's about all. That's, that's what happened. 
So, uh, but corn was one of the number one was one of the number one crops, as well as tobacco, squash, walnuts. All these things was was crops that the the Seneca Mocha had was raising long before the English came. And they were actually doing pretty good raising these crops. All in all, these people were well fed. They had wonderful physiques. They were very healthy people. They didn't have any real bad problems in terms of uh, food at all. There's no history that they ever had problems with food until after the decimation of the English, and then after the English came. And the reason they had problems with food after the English came because it was forbidden for them to do a lot of things. It just was became a crime punishable by incarceration or slavery or death. So a lot of things became very, very, uh, you know, not the best for them. A lot of things became that way. So what I'm doing now is something called blocking and going back to the painting aspect. Just in case you're interested in the painting, I'm blocking in the painting. Now I do have other, uh, I do have other uh, painting sessions where I explain some of this stuff as well. Hey, somebody's waving. Let me see who it is. Let's see. Keep Wilkerson, what's up, man, from high school? Hey, Gary, what's up? How you doing, man? I'm basically painting our ancestors, Gary. That's the Matapanai, who were called the Powhite Atens. That's actually how you pronounce it properly. But they also call, the actual name was called the Tsenikamoka. A lot of people don't know that. T S E N A N uh, 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 N A C O M M O I mean H A A A H Seneca Mocha. Uh, so basically this is the abduction of Matoaka. Her name was not Powhatan, her name was Patoaka. So that's what this painting is. This is a uh, 69 inches by 103 inches. And uh, I got basically John Roth holding a knife to Matoaka's throat. This is Opep Chanakano. He later actually was a monkey originally. And then, of course, what happened was the monkeys got under the influence, under the control of the Jamestown people. And he basically made his headquarters out of the Mattapanai, the upper Mattapanai, which is actually close to where we live. Very close. And probably that's our people. As grandpa's people. <laughs> but anyway, uh, make a long story short, Opek Chanakano was a real tough guy. So was Wahan Tanuka. Uh, the person's name was not Powhatan. His, he was from the Pow, uh, Powhite Aten tribe. Basically, it was Church Hill, right where Simaraza is. That's where Powhatan lived. He overlooked the area called Bon Air. That view right over the, the James River was originally called the Powhite River. And of course, the Powhite River round, wound through the area called Powhite. And Powhite Aten means the beautiful view of the sun, of the divine lands. Basically, that's what it meant. Powhite Aten. And he had the, he had, if you go there, you can look out as far as you can off of Shimaraza Park Cliff or Hill. Because it was called Power Aiton Hill. Now I don't know the name in the original language to Seneca Mocha language, but I'm kind of, uh, you know, we're trying to. Uh, there is an ability to learn to relearn the full language now. So they basically have been able to put the language back together. So instead of having little words here and there, you actually can put together the language of your ancestors and actually speak it again, if you should want to. And I was just remembering the pictures of Uncle Farney. Great Uncle Farney and, and Grandpa and all them. And some of the pictures, if you was to look at Opechanacano, 
The depictions of the original to Seneca Mocha look exactly like them. Exactly. See, I was thinking, well, geez, how much, how much was Grandpa and them possibly almost 100% to Seneca Mocha? I don't know. Because if you left the reservation, you would consider a renegade. And for whatever reason, you, you know, they passed a law where you, if you were a certain complexion, you was listed as mulatto, white, or black. So you could be an African person and become a slave and actually was originally a Native American. Whether you was a Native American of, of mixed ancestry or you was a full-blooded. If you was a certain complexion, it didn't matter. They basically sent people to your home, access you, and they labeled you as black or white or mulatto. Most of the time, you didn't get a mulatto status. You got the status of black or white. And that's called paper genocide. And what they did with that paper genocide, uh, a lot of us lost our second, our first our nation within a nation status. And it took away a lot of our autonomy. We had a uh, full different set of laws that we live by other than with other people. We also were American citizens, but at the same time, because of the uniqueness of the situation, uh, there was dual citizenship. Probably that Creed Sr., Grandpa's dad and them, enjoyed, which was, uh, was around the time when they changed the law. Now, because Grandpa's dad was already dead before we were born, we didn't get to know, learn that. I mean, nobody, mom didn't teach us that um, because grandpa didn't teach us that, you know? Hopefully, if Uncle Fonny would have, could, would have stayed alive long enough, he probably would have been the one with the knowledge of that. Grandpa just didn't, didn't teach us that. Uh, I don't know what Uncle Henry knew, you know? Uncle Henry didn't have any children. So, uh... It's just very interesting, man, when you actually dive into the actual history, the full history, and see how basically we was we was robbed, man. <laughs> I mean, just it's point blank. And uh, we could actually have status. We should actually have full, everybody in the family should actually have full status as Native American to Seneca Mocha. That was taken away around 1920s, 1930s. This guy, he actually was uh, in the a state government. He was there for 30 years. He was in charge of statistics and information. He reclassified all the people who were originally called Powhatans or Tsetika Mocha uh, as basically if you weren't on the reservation, you did not enjoy a status other than black or white. Of course, you know, emancipation had already happened, so it was no need of keeping three different groups. The African slaves, uh, you know, they kept the African slaves in place, but now that the Africans are free, now you, you had a complex situation. So what happened was they just basically pushed you into the black group or they pushed you into the white group. That's basically what happened to our family. That's what happened to us. <clears throat> But the Native Americans didn't care about that anyway, so it was easy for them to do that. They didn't really care if you called them black, white, or anything. They knew exactly what they were, but they weren't going to do a lot of speaking out and protesting on that. They just, oh, well, I'm still farming like I always have. So they didn't worry about it. Uh, sometimes it's good to worry about things because for future generations, it starts to complicate things for us, man. It takes away our heritage. And uh, so, anyway, that's why I'm doing this painting. I'm going to do a whole series on the Tessinica Mocha. I'm going to do a whole series on this. Because they did a lot of things to the person they call Pocahontas, Matoaka. And uh, I just want the whole world to find out about it, the truth part. And not only, and I'm going to do that through painting. I'm going to do that through simply painting the, the pictures, man. You know, like grandma used to say, tell the truth and shame the devil. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell the truth and expose the rottenness. And John Roth was a terrible fiend, and so was Captain John Smith. And so that's why this painting 
I'm painting this way. Now, if people are upset about it, I don't care. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I don't even slightly care. I mean, I'm going to do what's right for, for, for my own heritage and for my own family. That's what I'm going to do. And for the actual, so future generations, whether you're a generation that want to know about it or not, there's other generations that might be much more intellectual than you are, that might want to know something. So I think it's very important. I think it's very important for us to go ahead and um, and do the, the necessary work, man, so that we can um, we can preserve, we can actually at least have knowledge. Everybody can have full knowledge and heritage. Otherwise, it's going to be forgotten by the rest of the family members. It's going to go away, and then you're going to have a very shallow past. Uh, our, we're lucky because our past can go into the, at least the 1700s documented. But when it goes before the, the 1700s, it starts to get a little obscure because of what the things I'm finding out. I know why it got obscure, because basically they were trying to, the natives basically still had ownership of the territory. And it was just a matter of uh, systematically taking it away from them and, re and reallocating the land to new settlers. And so, uh, therefore, uh, when this happened, it was very important to take whatever people that could make a claim to that and cause them to forget. And the way you did that was you reclassified those people or you pressed them into slavery and changed their name to an English name and the children, anyway, you, you killed the, the man. Sometimes you would let the woman live. And then you had a slave, and you, you either mixed that person with an African person who was a slave or other natives who were slaves. And then also a lot of times what natives would do, instead of having to run all the way up to the north, they would just run to the uh, a few miles down the road, you know, like down in King William. If you wanted to, if you was a slave out there, all you had to do was go about 10, 5 or 10 miles to the road and join the tribe if you if they accepted you. And of course, what the tribal members had to do, people said, well, the Native Americans had slaves. Well, what they had to do is prove to the white people when they came, because you know, the slave hunter, or whoever the slave catcher was, he was going to come looking for his property. And you had to have paperwork, even though that might have been a family member now, you wind up intermarrying with the person. You had to have paperwork to say, you know, this person, you can't take this person. It belongs to us. Even though the person did belong to them, it was the system not of the natives. It was the system of the, of the English. But that was the only way for you to keep your loved ones in, you know, free. You know, it was the only way. They had to be listed that way. So a lot of this was happening. Um, you could be pressed into slavery if you just, either if you was a native who married a black or if you were just a dark complexion native and somebody who wasn't your family caught you and took you somewhere, they could literally classify you as, as a slave, as an African slave. And after that, you, because there was some intermarrying, it was, I believe that the, uh, there was Moors, there was Spanish, black moors that was living in Virginia amongst the natives and intermarrying with them before Jamestown happened because if you look at the pictures of the uh, the power tans, actually the Tocinica Mocha is more correctly called, uh, that the English painted, these people had interesting texture hair, let's put it that way. And their features was painted, and I don't believe they was painted just because it was a style and they just couldn't paint or draw the right way because different artists drew them exactly the similar, very the same way. And then when you see those same artists draw other things, the likeness looks right. So I don't think they just couldn't see right. I think what happened was uh, there was uh, African people that was already trading all the way from down where the Seminoles were in, in Florida all the way up to through the Carolinas, especially the Gullah and the Geechee people, you know, along the coast. You know, you go up Route 13, that's what you're going to see. I believe that those people was already here uh, peacefully dealing with the Native Americans. 
And the English just followed them here. And then what happened was they just started, uh, they just started basically English arising, Anglo arising. And, you know, uh, changing everything. They gave everything like a, a Anglo Christian name. And a lot of these names are similar to the native names, which is really weird. Except they would just change the meaning. You know, like Churchill was really Pow Paha Eiton Hill. And Shimaraza was literally the the, the 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 power place, the lookout place for that particular tribe of Pow Hyton. And 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 the person they called Chief Powhatan, his actual sub tribe was called the Pow Hyton. But the actual overall tribe was actually called the Seneca Mocha, which is which is very, very interesting that they had to make that name go because that name basically was the whole state of Virginia. The original name for the entire state of Virginia was called to Seneca Mocha. Power Height was only the name for Richmond, specifically the Churchill area of Richmond, and the Bon Air area of Richmond. And of course, the James River was originally called the Powhite Height River. <laughs> Real simple. Uh, and of course, they had to rename that in the name of the king at the time, which, as you, you know, King, king uh, James, same King James that wrote the Bible. That King James took away the Powhite name from the James River, or at least they took it away in honor of him. So they were about really just reappropriating everything for an English civilization and really usurping the original civilization completely that basic was the Seneca Mocha. So this is basic archaeology now. This is true fact. This is 100% provable. And a lot of this is provable from Captain John Smith and John Rolfe's own record as well as uh, uh, other uh, people who basically were scouting for the, for the, for the, for the London Company to basically, uh, there was never a settlement. It was an invasion. They was going to do the exact same thing that Cortez had done in Mexico. But they was doing it for England. And that's what it was all about. You had the aristocracy financed by Virginia, I mean, uh, English rich for their country to claim this whole area for England. And these, I guess these people in England didn't know that a hundred years later, uh, the peasants that came over here from England would say, okay, I know the aristocracy paid to subdue the natives, but at this point, you know, we're going to do a Boston Tea Party and all this kind of stuff. At this point, what we're going to do is we're going to take this for us, you know, <laughs> and that didn't work out for the English. It didn't became the United States of America at that point. So it was there was never really a name. I mean, what kind of name for a country is the United States? You know, you have one country that's called Virginia. You had another country that's called Pennsylvania. You had another country called Boston. You had another one called York, New York. These were actually independent little, you call it a state, because you have to call it a state because it's stolen land. It's unofficial. But it still, it had their own, like, the Virginia had its House of Burgess, so it had its own government. So uh, it's really interesting when you see the actual step-by-step -step things that was done. There was a genocide plan that was passed down by the uh, Jamestown people, the original founding families, with John Roth's family was one of them, from generation to generation, a planned genocide. And the victims of that genocide and the victims of the colonization was African people and Native Americans. And this is by plan. This didn't happen just in a bubble. This happened because it was a very deliberate thing. 
It was a very uh, planned thing that had to go down. I found that to be very interesting how like a certain group can really just plan all this stuff and not only just plan it but to pass it down to plan down from generation to generation in order to keep power with their descendants and then they, they talk about no reparations no 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 reparations for descendants of slaves or Native Americans from what I'm finding out there sure should be <laughs> They should be because the atrocities was just as Holocaust-like as any other groups that studied, it suffered any kind of uh, discomfort or Holocaust. And even today, a lot of these people are still in a, in a position a lot less than it would be if they would have kept their original status and kept their control that they originally had. Because a lot of the uh, people who are the fishermen of Eastern Virginia, like all down through, all the way to West Point, going down Route 30, and King William, all the way down through, uh, really all the way out to the Chesapeake Bay, those people were always mixed. They were either mixed with white and, and black and native, or they were just white and native or black and native. But <laughs> that's who they were. And that's who Grandpa and them were. The problem with, with Grandpa and them, you know, they came through the Depression years and all those years. They lost a lot of that. That information didn't get passed on properly to the future generations. I mean, we lost a lot of that stuff. They just didn't. I believe their father probably would have talked about it. But you know, by the time we was born, he had already had like a stroke. And we was really tiny, we was really young. So I think I remember seeing him, you know, we'd go out there and ride the horse and stuff every once in a while. But it wasn't that long before, you know, he was gone. You know, we only went out there during the summers. And <laughs>